right. Well, welcome everyone to our September NOAA and the Caribbean Community Webinar. We are really excited to have you all here and have an exciting lineup of speakers um, to present on a variety of activities and projects that are taking place within the Caribbean region. Um, so my name is Katie Jedrick. I am one of the uh, members of the executive team, um, the executive secretariat. Um, so I'm just going to go over a few webinar logistics for this morning, and then I'm going to turn it over to Lee for um, some background of our group. Um, so all participants um, that have logged on are in listen-only mode. Um, if you have any audio issues, um, you can call in at this number, um, but please let us know in the chat if there's anything um, weird happening. Um, throughout the presentations today, um, we will have question, uh, uh, question and answer period following the, pre the presentation. Um, all of the questions can be submitted um, via this question bubble. Um, so the icon looks like this and it should be right on your dashboard. Um, we will moderate the questions um, as they come in right after the speakers present. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and we will be posting this up on our webpage. Uh, and we will also have English and Spanish subtitles um, uh, incorporated into the presentation. Uh, and so with that, I will turn it over to Lee for some background of NOAA and the Caribbean. Perfect. Thanks, Katie. So my name is Lee Karuba, and I am the chair for the NOAA in the Caribbean initiative. As some of you may already know, because I know we have some folks participating who have been with us at least for a while, if not from the beginning, uh, we came about because NOAA Southeast and Caribbean Regional Team committed to forming NOAA in the Caribbean in 2009. The reason that happened was because CCART, which is the Southeast and Caribbean Regional Team, had already formed a NOAA in the Carolinas, and they kind of pitched the idea to those of us in the Caribbean to see if there was interest in engaging partners in the region more closely, keeping them more up to date about what NOAA is doing in the region and what our partners are doing to really foster collaboration. So we had a meeting with NOAA and non-NOAA partners first in 2008, and because people liked the idea, we then um, began to form NOAA in the Caribbean in 2009. We had a scoping meeting in 2010 to kind of formalize who we are and what we do. And then we had a town hall meeting in 2011 to really uh, talk more about how to move forward, get recommendations from partners and, more, and do a little bit more formalization of our structure. So we were created in order to identify and respond to local and regional challenges, needs, and opportunities. What that really means is that we are hoping to be a conduit for communication between partners and NOAA in the Caribbean about what we're all doing and how we can potentially work together to kind of get more bang for our buck by working together and making sure that we respond to local needs. So I'll talk a little bit more about um, our 2019 partners meeting, but basically we try to really respond to needs that are raised by our partners in the region. We have changed our organization a little bit. We now have an executive team and you can see most of them except me because my camera's not working and <laughs> Makeda Kolo who could not be with us. She might jump on for a little bit, but she could not be with us for our entire community webinar. I am the chair, as I mentioned, Makeda is the vice chair, and then Sammy and Gino and Katie are the other members of our executive team, and Gino is also the coordinator for CCART, the Southeast and Caribbean regional team. And then we also have a steering committee, which has now grown to, to be pretty large. Um, some of our presenters are actually on our steering committee. Some of the people who I know are actually here as attendees in the webinar are also part of our steering committee. And we are now meeting bi-monthly um, with, and we've changed that format as well to give opportunities for steering committee members to talk about what they're doing and also other NOAA offices to talk about what they're doing in the region. So again, just trying to really foster that collaboration. Go ahead, Katie. So some of the things that we do and have managed to accomplish over time, we did, as I mentioned, we really kind of formalized NOAA in the Caribbean in 2011. And we started putting out a newsletter in 2012. It's now become virtual. So it used to be kind of more of a 
PDF format and now under leadership of folks like Katie who are far more technologically savvy. Um, we have a more virtual format that goes out now to more than 700 people on a quarterly basis. And I'm sure some of you have seen the messages from Katie asking for story ideas. Everyone is welcome to submit their story ideas. Um, we also have a web page that was created in 2012. I will caveat that to say the web page is still in an older format. We know that. We are hopefully next in line to get it updated and make it look like all the other uh, revised NOAA web pages that you may have seen now. So that is in progress. In the meantime though, for events like this one, the community webinar and also our 2019 partners meeting, we do actually have web pages that have information for attendees and others who are interested. We started doing partner meetings every other year starting in 2012. As you can imagine, because of the 2017 hurricane season and then the government shutdown, our 2018 one um, was a little bit uh, delayed. So we were able to do it in August of 2019. We held the workshop in San Juan and another in St. Croix. And the main themes, which came from uh, communicating with our partners in the region, in Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico, focused on applying the concepts of engineering with nature and green infrastructure, largely because of all the coastal erosion and storm surge issues that were seen related to the 2017 hurricanes and thinking about solutions to that that are not just um, typical engineered structures, but also other ways to incorporate kind of a mix of structural solutions and green infrastructure. And the other main theme was reinsurance and adaptation planning. So adaptation planning, really thinking about how coastal communities affected by things like the hurricanes can begin to adapt to the issue of climate change. And then reinsurance, some of you may be familiar with, it was actually a new concept for many of us and it was fun to hear about, but kind of using the natural environment such as in Quintana Roo in, in Mexico and, um, and actually ensuring the reefs through some of the hotels there. So it's a, it's a really interesting idea to explore. And again, if you want more information, you can find the links to all the presentations and supplemental materials from that stakeholder workshop. Go ahead, Katie. I think that might be you yeah. then. Yeah. Yes. Um, so again, thank you all so much for joining our community webinar. Um, we're really excited to hear updates from you know, folks that work um, within NOAA, within the different line offices and program offices, but also hear from our partners within the region um, you know, that are really focused in on you know, the universe, uh, USBI as well as Puerto Rico, and then the greater Caribbean as well. Um, and this is really an opportunity for us to create new partnerships as well as continue these partnerships um, and really engage with our partners and, and, and foster these collaborative um, methods. Um, we also really um, are here to highlight um, these priorities that we've identified you know, in previous uh, workshops and meetings um, by Puerto Rico as well as the US Virgin Islands. Um, and so quickly, we just want to, you know, gauge, you know, who is here um, uh, on our webinar this morning. Um, so I have a few poll questions that I'm going to um, throw up. And so you'll be able to answer these directly uh, on your screen. All right. So our first poll question is, what is your current affiliation? All right, we'll give it about 10 more seconds. If you haven't voted, go ahead and select one of the following. All 
All right. So it looks like majority of us are coming from NOAA um, and then a, a good handful from other federal agencies and academic institutions. Well, great. There we go. All right. And then our next question um, is, where are you currently located? See them all coming in now. All right, we'll give it about 10 more seconds. Awesome. Well, as expected, I'm sure a lot of us were coming from the continental US, um, but we also see a, a big group, you know, from the, from the region, which is really exciting to, to see. And we're really excited to, to provide updates um, for folks in the region. And then our last question is, had you heard of NOAA in the Caribbean before this webinar? You know, we've really tried to, to get our name out there, provide a lot of different, um, you know, services and products um, for folks, you know, both um, within NOAA, but outside with our partners. And so we're really eager to hear, you know, if we're, we're reaching you. All right, we'll give it about 10 more seconds. Great. Well, great, that's um, exciting to hear. Um, and for those that haven't heard of us before, we're really excited um, to you know, provide an update of you know, what, we, what we're doing what, um, and you know, how you can contribute to our group. Um, so we're really excited to connect with you. All right, so um, all right. Whoop, where'd it go? There we go. All right. Well, th thank you for um, filling out that poll. You know, it's always nice to see you know who's in the audience, not only for us, um, but for for one another. Um, so before we jump into our presentations this morning, I just wanted to walk through our agenda for the day. Um, our first session is all about marine ecosystems. So we'll, so we'll have um, three featured talks there. Um, after that session, we'll have a quick break. Um, and then we'll come back for our last two sessions, um, hazards and climate resilience, and then broader Caribbean engagement. Um, and then we'll close off the day um, with just some closing remarks and we'll be able to share um, some of our different web links um, and as well as our newsletter that you can sign up for. All right, um, Gino, Sammy, anyone else have anything to add before I turn it over to our speakers? Yeah, this is Lee Katie. There's a I, I've been answering the, the questions, but just for everybody in case you're not watching the, the question box, um, the presentations will be posted on the event website. Yeah. So everybody will be able to see them after the webinar once we've got them up. Great. Thank you so much for catching that. All right. Excellent. Well, I just wanted to thank everybody for joining us this morning. So appreciate everybody coming in and hope everybody has a great opportunity to, to learn more about the our, our partners and the work we do in the Caribbean. Awesome. All right, well, if Stacy and Michelle, as well as Leslie wanna hop on. 
So Michelle Scherer uh, graduated with a bachelor's degree in zoology at the University of Central Florida, a master's in biology and PhD in biological oceanography at the Department of Marine Sciences at the University of Puerto Rico. Uh, she's currently a researcher and scientific consultant at HJR Reefscaping, working on diverse projects related to coral reef ecology, fish acoustics, fisheries, um, habitat restoration, and MPA management in the, in the US Caribbean. Also a board member on the Gulf and Caribbean Fisheries Institute and collaborator of the Center for Interdisciplinary Coastal Studies at the University of Puerto Rico Mayaguez campus. And then Stacy uh, is a benthic ecologist and co-founder of the Institute for Socioecological Research and Coastal Survey Solutions in Puerto Rico. Uh, she has evaluated the coral reef health at more than 300 reefs in 15 Caribbean countries. She is the PI of the Diadema Restoration Project and runs the only land-based coral nursery in Puerto Rico. Well, Stacey and Michelle, I will uh, turn it over to you guys. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. My name is Stacey Williams, and today, along with uh, Dr. Michelle Scherer, uh, we'll be giving a quick synopsis of the coral reef monitoring in Puerto Rico. Uh, next. So Puerto Rico archipelago, uh, for those that do not know, is in the Northern Caribbean. It's between Hispaniola and the U.S. Virgin Islands and the BBI Islands. Next. We have extensive uh, shallow water coral reef ecosystems uh, around the mainland, uh, over 5,000 square kilometers. Next. So today I'm going to be talking about the two different monitoring programs that um, has been carried out in Puerto Rico, the Puerto Rico Long-Term Coral Reef Monitoring Program. This is the local program and also the National Coral Reef Monitoring Program, NCRIM. Both have very similar goals um, to measure and assess uh, the reef conditions and to track patterns um, in these ecosystems by serving biological indicators such as benthic or fish communities. Um, the local monitoring program also aims to understand the response variability of the fish and benthic community to natural disturbances like bleaching and hurricane events. Uh, the two programs have two different experimental designs. The local program, uh, we monitor permanent stations at reefs, um, and these reefs were chosen based on optimal coral growth, while NCRIM uh, design is a stratified random design that it targets different reef habitats in depth. Uh, both measure similar biological indicators, such as uh, reef fish abundance, biomass density, uh, diversity, sorry, and also coral cover and other benthic organisms. Um, but NCRIM also looks, uh, we assess the coral demographics, such as coral size and coral condition. The next. So here's a map. Uh, up. We went backwards. So I'll be showing you a map of the Puerto Rico uh, Coral Reef Monitoring Program site. Um, these are a lot of sites. Um, they started in 1999, uh, the surveys. Next. Um, however, in 2012, we've been targeting the surveys at 42 reefs, um, and half of these reefs are surveyed biannually. So we survey 21 sites one year and then 21 sites the next year. So next. So just a quick conclusion of what, uh, uh, and then 2019 um, results that we, what we found were that uh, since the 2005 bleaching event, uh, we, we saw significant losses from that bleaching event. We're still seeing uh, some reefs in decline in coral cover. However, there's some reefs that have stabilized, some reefs have shown some recovery. Um, but we are seeing a wide range of coral covers between 4% to, which is really low, to compared to close to 42% um, off the West Coast. We did uh, observe that Hurricane Marie not Maria not only impacted the coral cover, um, but also uh, had an effect uh, on the fish assemblages. And there was a loss of numerically dominant fish species like the mass at some of the sites in our last surveys in 2019. 
um, what we're now seeing, um, both in 2018 and 2019 surveys, uh, is that we're seeing an increase in Ramicrusta. This is an encrusting red algae. It's uh, dangerous algae because it could overgrow on uh, pale corals. So we're seeing an increase in an order of magnitude um, in, this, uh, in this algae uh, throughout the site. So I will hand it over now to Michelle, who will be talking about NCRIM. The NCRIM program has a wider view of addressing the, sort of the same questions of um, coral cover and macroalgal cover and fish abundance and diversity. So we began this um, in 2014, where we were able to cover 230 different sites. And the number that says demo is 126 transects that were specifically measuring corals and addressing if they were healthy or impacted with recent or old mortality. So in the next slide, you can see how in 2016, we, address, we were able to survey 162 sites, um, of which 157 had demo transects on it. And actually, the end of this uh, year's surveys was impacted by Hurricane Maria. Um, in the next slide, would then we have what was accomplished in 2019 around Puerto Rico. And we had a total of 203 sites, of which 160 had demographic transects. So because this is an ongoing, long-term, wide-scale monitoring, in the next slide, we have a summary that was made by the status report for Puerto Rico. And in that analysis where they looked at the data from 2014 to 2017 in Puerto Rico against a reference site in the U.S. Virgin Islands, we ended up with a C. So our reefs are in a 70% out of 100 condition, um, mainly because uh, algae are overtaking most of the benthic substrate. Um, we can subdivide this in the, in the status report in a little bit more in where fish had a D between 60 and 69 percent, mainly due to the low diversity on our reefs. And this is an, uh, considered critical in the report. In the next slide, um, you can actually go to the, to the report and look at it further, uh, thanks to the collaboration with other folks at NOAA. It was translated into Spanish, so it's available in English and in Spanish. And the results of the program that Stacy was talking about are available at the Puerto Rico Department of Natural Environmental Resources website. Um, just because we're short on time, I'd like to acknowledge all our colleagues at NOAA, especially those um, at what is known as BioGeo's team, Randy Clark and Jennifer Schull, which were the first ones that came down here to help us kick off NCRIM. Uh, Kimberly Edwards and Chris Jeffries. Um, due to the limitations here that we don't have a lot of in-kind divers, a lot of NOAA folks came down and dove with us many of those sites. So we also want to acknowledge the University of Puerto Rico that provided support and diving activities. Um, the Department of Natural Resources that has been supporting the long-term Puerto Rico coral reef monitoring for so long. Uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife and Equoelectrica also donated some boat time um, and captains for our efforts. And finally, the volunteers and the NGOs, Amigos de Tres Palmas and Islamar Research, who also helped us address a lot of uh, spots where we couldn't get with the general sampling, but we were able to add some, uh, especially with the support of the Coastal Zone Management Program of the Department of Puerto Rico, uh, Department of Natural Resources of Puerto Rico. That's all for now. We're out of time, but we'd be happy to entertain any questions. Great. Well, actually, I'll have um, Leslie go, and then we can um, open it up for questions for all of you. All right.
All right. So our next speaker is Leslie Henderson. Um, Leslie was born and raised uh, in North Carolina and has spent the last 11 years living and working in the U.S. Virgin Islands. She has worked in the field of coral reef research, management and conservation at the University of the Virgin Islands and the Department of Planning and Natural Resources. She currently serves as the USVI Coral and Coastal Management Liaison for Linker CSS on contract to NOAA's Office for Coastal Management. Um, and she's going to talk about um, the coral reef monitoring in in the USVI. Thanks. Um, good morning, everyone. And I just want to say that um, I was really pleasantly surprised with that last presentation. It really meshes well with mine. I was given the same topic. We actually produced similar presentations, even down to the cover photo. So um, we can go to my first slide. I'm going to talk a little bit about the USVI version. A lot of this is going to be similar, so I don't have to delve too far into it. On the left, you'll see our TCRIMP, what we call Territorial Coral Reef Monitoring Program, and on the right is NCRIMP sites. And so you can see there are more sites on NCRIMP, and that actually, that map doesn't even include 2015 or 2017 and 2019 data. Um, on the left, you'll see the long-term fixed sites uh, in purple. So you just see we have pretty good coverage across the Virgin Islands. Um, Stacy already went into some of the differences between local monitoring and NCRIMP, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that, other than to say that some of the advantages of TCRIMP are that it is cheaper, it is a little bit easier to be adaptive to managers' requests. Um, NCRIMP is comparable across wider distances and standardized across the nation, uh, but that's not always really important to the local manager, so they, have, they both have their um, advantages and disadvantages. Next slide. So what is monitored? Basically the coral um, and the fish. Lots of other things are monitored as well. And depending on the program and the year, there is additional data that can be found on lots of different aspects of the coral reef. Next slide. And I get this, this question a lot, how are the reefs doing? And if you really wanna know, these are the two sources I would direct you to. There is the status report on the right for NCRIM. Um, there's also the annual coral reef uh, monitoring report that is developed locally, and those are both available to be downloaded um, online. Next slide. But how are the reefs doing? Um, these two graph graphics sort of try to sum it up, and on the left you'll see data from the TCRIP program, and all this is is all the sites that are monitored, um, the absolute coral cover from 2019, which is our most recent data point, and then how much that has changed since the first year it was monitored. As you can see, a lot of these are red, um, but what I wanted to point out about this, these two tables is that there is a lot of variation. Some sites are maintaining high coral, high coral cover, some have actually gained a little bit, and some are decreasing rapidly, some are decreasing only a little bit. So there is a lot of variation and really teasing apart why some reefs are doing better than others is sort of the next step in coral monitoring, um, in my opinion. And then on the right, you'll see the NCRIMP uh, wheel that comes from the status report, and we scored a 72%. That takes into account much more than coral cover. That takes into account fish and um, you know all of the variables on that, on that wheel. So everything is fine, I would say. Um, next slide. So what do the local managers actually get from the data? We all know that local managers don't always go into the nitty gritty um, and run their own sort of analysis when doing things like looking to um, approve or deny a permit. But um, the TCRIP program is really strong in that there is always a research highlight section in that annual report. And it is usually um, at request of the manager. So over the past four or five years, some of the topics have been, you know, uh, disaster impacts specifically, or invasive species impacts, or success stories. Really, whatever the manager kind of asks for, the TCRIP program is really good at turning around and saying, okay, well, let's work up our monitoring data and write a brief summary about what the data is telling us on that topic. And that's really been really, really useful um, and really distills information without having to wait for um, peer-reviewed publications and then trying to disseminate that information 
for the management community. I'll also note that there is a cool uh, resilience meta-analysis coming up from the University of the Virgin Islands, who is the subcontractor for the TCRENT program. And that's gonna be really neat, kind of looking at which environmental and reef characteristics are driving those variations in coral cover change over time. Next. So what do managers get from the data on NCRIMP side? There are three major, in my opinion, um, reports. Uh, the data summary report, which gives a really thorough look at everything that was collected for the um, for the uh, coral monitoring part. There's also the status report, which we've talked a little bit already. And then there is the really cool social science infographic and social science report that comes out of NCRIM. And that is a um, really cool piece that that isn't really added into the territorial program. And so I'm, I'm a big fan of that social science aspect. It gives you a good idea of what people's perceptions of the reef are, which after all is kind of critical if you want to enact any kind of behavior change or track your progress in a lot of your outreach programs. And I think that is it for me. So I'll just be here to answer questions. Great. Uh, Lee, are there any questions in our chat? We have a bunch of questions. So should I start with Leslie and then we'll bring back Michelle and Stacy? That sounds great. Okay, so Leslie, first one for you. How does Uncramp, wait, it just moved, sorry, sorry. Wait, stop checking. Um, <laughs> how does Uncramp establish trends if sites are randomly chosen? That's a good question. And I think that um, it takes, a longer time period. So in order to, they're, they're, the sites are random, but they are categorized into different types of reef. And their goal is to oh, like sample a lot more so that you can get a average for that reef category. And then over time, you can still see trends. Um, it just, you need to sample a lot more and it hasn't been going on really long enough to to see those trends just yet hopefully soon we do have you know four or five data points now um but that's something that NCRIP is, is working on and i believe they are talking about adding some fixed sites to the mix as well okay great and then um someone asked for you to repeat how lionfish is impacting the coral so lionfish are an invasive sorry there's a truck outside parking, apparently. Uh, lionfish are, sorry guys, lionfish are an invasive species here and they eat, what, I don't know what them, they eat um, uh, other fish and invertebrates that are positive for the reef. And so the theory goes that if the lionfish are, remain unchecked on the reef, they could gobble up things like the herbivores that clean the reef, but also the fish that are important to commercial fisheries, and they can have negative impacts on other fish stocks and eventually um, the event community. Um, we haven't really been seeing that necessarily. In my, in my own opinion, I feel like that impact is less important than a lot of the other stressors that the reefs are, are feeling at this time. And also we have a lot of really dedicated lionfish hunters in the Virgin Islands that get out there and they are shooting lionfish all the time and cooking them up and making delicious ceviche and things like that, so. Okay, great. So now I'm gonna harass Michelle and Stacy if you all can come back on. And then, um, but stay on Leslie because there's a question that cuts across all of you. <laughs> So while Michelle and Stacey are getting on, let me ask the question that's for all of you. Um, the question is, do some of the data that you're gathering also help understand how waves move across coral reefs and flooding on the shoreline? Can you repeat that question? Yes. Based on, based on the studies that you're doing, can that help understand how waves are moving across coral reefs and causing flooding on tropical shorelines? Well, the, so yeah, some of these really, yeah, some of these, uh, 
so the reset we have been serving both in NCRIM and in the local um, monitoring program um, are shallow water structures that are, are well and some of these areas have uh, corals that are framework building corals that build these really nice structures that protect the reef. Um, and we have seen after the Hurricane Maria that there has been some destruction of these reefs. And, and in these areas, we did see a lot of flooding, uh, coastal flooding from the wave surges, um, wave surge from, from the actual storm. So this program not necessarily tackles that specific problem, but indirectly we have seen the results uh, of Hurricane Maria and, the, and, and its impact um, on the coastal, the actual coastal communities around um, the island of Puerto Rico, and I'm sure the USDI. Yeah, I would I would say that that the data gathered in our coral monitoring uh, programs feeds the models that that they use to do studies like that and look at how wave waves are changing with reef uh, growth and death. So we're not directly monitoring that, but like Stacy said, it's sort of helping feed some of those other studies that to look at that question. Okay, great. And then just, I'm gonna just I'm gonna do one more question in the interest of time. I will just answer one thing that someone asked, us, which was about stony coral tissue loss disease. Stay tuned, we have a presentation specific to that. So we'll answer hopefully your question about the presentation. But so Stacy and Michelle, any of the monitoring efforts tied directly to management actions, for example, tied to identify trigger points when a specific management action has been reached? Actually, that's one of the goals that um, we've taken up with our partners at the Department of Natural Resources and the NGO Amigos de Tres Palmas. They were interested in seeing if the no-take zone that was designated near Rincon Beach, if that actually can provide data to support uh, addressing the effects of this no-take. Um, NCRIM is not designed to do that, but thanks to their partnering, we were able to collect more data to be able to answer that question in the future. So I think that's one part where we can say, yes, we're addressing a management question. Okay, great. Thank you. I think we need to move on in the interest of time. There are more questions for you, so maybe we can follow up afterwards. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Thank you all so much for that presentation. Our next speaker is Alida Ortiz, soil mayor. Uh, she's going to be presenting on island-based fishery management plans. Um, and she received her PhD degree in marine sciences at the University of Puerto Rico. Um, she has been an educator in environmental education and marine sciences since 1968 at undergraduate and graduate levels. Uh, she's retired from the University of Puerto Rico in 2000, and at present, she is the chair of the Outreach and Education Advisory Board of the Caribbean Fishery Management Council since 2012. Welcome, Alida. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, I will try to share with you in a very, very short time what the F Caribbean Fishery Management Council has been working with in fishery management plans. So we will go through the details uh, that we have been followed. Next. Uh, all the information on uh, the ecosystem-based fishery management, which is probably one of the most important uh, changes or additions or, or whatever you want to call it, that has been done to these management plans for the Caribbean region, we have it in, it is in this a document, the ecosystem-based fishery management in the U.S. Caribbean regions as a roadmap for the implementation plan. And that's available at the council website. But there are some guiding principles that we all have to have in mind and understand, not just as scientists or, or developers or managers, but as consumers and as uh, human beings that use the marine environment for fishing. And these are the, in, it's an implementation of the planning at the ecosystem level. 
So we have to understand the processes. We have to understand and prioritize those vulnerabilities and risks in these ecosystems. And we have to understand what are the, the trade-offs between the ecosystem and how they work and to incorporate that into management and advice. So that's the only way my resilient ecosystem can be maintained. And as I say, this is not knowledge just for the fishers or for the managers, it's also knowledge needed for the consumers. Next one. So we go to the very basic of the ecosystem. And that's a, a term that we use probably daily but do we know what it is the what are the components of that ecosystem? We have to understand all the living organisms, that's the biotic, and that includes all organisms. And human beings are still biological organisms. So we are part of that ecosystem. The biotic co uh, component that it has all the chemical, the space, water, temperature, light, light that make the ecosystem and also the processes that occur there. When we take out fish, when we take out even energy from the ocean, we're using an ecological service. We're using a, a process that is maintaining that ecosystem and we are using it for our economic well-being. So if we don't understand the ecosystem, there are many things that we can do that is not going to be good for the ecosystem. Next one. So the essential fish habitat is another issue that it's uh, inserted in all the management plans. Management plans have to deal with the ecosystem as a general concept, but also as uh, where, what are these habitats, where especially fish, and the other organisms that compose the fisheries depend on. And that goes from the shore to the depth, from the mangroves, the mud bottoms, the seagrass beds, shallow water, deep water, water column. Many a times we see the fishing as the place or the area specifically where the fish are caught. But then we don't know that those fishes or those other animals probably passed most of their life in the shallow waters. So if the mangroves get affected, if the shorelines get affected, the, the uh, organism that live in the deeper waters will also be affected. So we have to understand the essential fish habitat. We have to understand the connection between this habitat. Next one. So if we're going to manage uh, fishing for a sustainable fishery, it has to take into account that the human being is part of that food web, that we are one of the consumers, secondary consumers, and that we consume probably everything that may be in the ocean. So it doesn't matter if we take algae, if we take uh, uh, plankton, if we take uh, uh, organisms that live under the, the rocks or live on the reef, we are part of that food web. So the fishing impacts the ecosystem and it, fish, it impacts the ecosystem in terms of the uh, activity, in terms of the gear, in terms of the time of the day that the fishing is done. And in, at the end, it removes some of those uh, species from the food web, but that a species is part of the, uh, the entire ecosystem, is part of the uh, processes that are going there. So we, through fishing, we can impact the composition and the size of fish populations, even though we might not be fishing that species in particular, but they are all connected in one way or another. Next one. And the Caribbean Fishery Management Council has their uh, responsibility or the task of do, making the management plans or the management regulations within the exclusive economic zone in the, in the U.S. Caribbean. And that's Puerto Rico, St. Thomas, St. John, and St. Croix. And the economic zone is the 
after the nine or after the territorial uh, jurisdiction, 200 miles uh, uh, far in the water. So there are some species that might be managed by the council in those waters. They may not necessarily are managed in the territorial water. But then if they have a, if they have a, the, the situation that they can move when young to adult from one part of the other because the fish cannot read where are the, the territorial or where are the jurisdictional waters. So we have to have agreements, we have to have collaborations between the local governments and the federal government for that for that management. Next one. The council has management plans since 1981 in the region until now. And those plans at the beginning and until the island-based fishery management plans are finally totally approved and in, 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 in regulation. We have plans for spiny lobsters, for shallow water reef fish, for coral and reef associated invertebrates, for queen con. Notice that these plans that are in place are based on the species. Of course, they have the ecosystem-based management integration into the plan. It has the essential fish habitat concept integrated into the plan, but they are based on the species that are uh, caught or that are part of those fisheries. And uh, the council produces a calendar so where when they, this uh, species can be uh, uh, fished, what the sizes that they can be fished, the number of them that can be fished. So that's the regulation and it's based on the species. And there are also closed areas. Next one. Closed areas where uh, some species are protected, where the spawning areas of some of the fishes are protected. And these closed areas are some in the St. Croix area, some in the St. Thomas, and some in Puerto Rico. And that's, those regulations are for those areas and it can be seasonal fishing or close area totally for, uh, for fishing. Next one. After many years of uh, implementing the management plans uh, based on the uh, species, so conch or spiny lobster, the regulations applied specifically to that species in any of the islands in Puerto Rico, in St. Thomas, in St. John. They could be different, but they were based only on the species. And for some time, the, the fishers and, and other stakeholders had the, the, the request that these plants should be based on the islands. And when we say on the islands is that you have a specific fishery management plan for Puerto Rico and a specific one for St. Thomas, St. John, and a specific one from St. Croix. Even though we may have waters that connect all the three islands or all the three uh, units, uh, there are cultural, there are historical difference among these islands. So, they might be fished in one way in St. Croix and in a different way in Puerto Rico. Even in Puerto Rico, we have a difference in, in fishing and even in the species that are fished and consumed between the west and the east coast and between the north and the south. So the, the island difference, the cultural and the socioeconomic difference of each one of these areas had to be taken into account. So in January 2012, the island-based uh, approach was initiated. And this ended with a separate stock complex harvest reference points. When we say stock complex harvest reference points means that some species are going to be managed in a different way in St. Croix and in a different way in Puerto Rico. 
and in different way in the in, in the uh, St. Thomas, St. John. Some might be managed in Puerto Rico, but not in the other islands. So in this island-based fishery management plans, where we have people that fish in a different way, people that uh, use the, the resource in a different way, they will also have different management practices. Next one. So three different island-based fishery management plans were developed. These uh, fishery management plans were developed with the extensive participation of the fishers and other community stakeholders. There were public hearings, there were documents for comments, there were many, many meetings, especially through, through the district advisory panels that are composed, uh, are composed with fishers from St. Croix, from St. Thomas, and from Puerto Rico, and they had uh, much input in what came in, in went in into these island-based uh, map plans. These are, uh, they were for the last uh, time for public comment until August, something of this year. So we expect that by the 2021, they might be in place. Uh, they are available at the Caribbean Fishery Management Council webpage. And uh, we will be working from then on with a specific issues in each one of the plans. Next one. Now, how does outreach and education uh, contribution uh, fits in into these plans? First of all, I think we found that the, the most important aspect, as we said at the beginning of the presentation, is that we have to know the ecosystem. We have to know the species. And it is not only the, the fisher, it's all the consumers, the, the people who buy for, to take home, the restaurants, the dealers. We have to know what importance or what role does that species play in the ecosystem? When are they in a reproduction stage? When you shouldn't uh, fish it? The, uh, the regulations will be based still on the fishes that are caught, but also on many other uh, aspects of how is it managed in each one of the islands. So we have produced uh, documents, uh, reading documents with the technical and the scientific information, but in a different language, in, in a different way of approaching it. So that uh, when, when a, a, a consumer, when a person goes to the fish market and they ask for this species, they want to, to buy at a grouper. Do they know what grouper they are buying? Do they know where it is caught? Do they know where, if there are seasonal uh, aspects in the biology of that organism? And we are also producing materials that are de uh, delivered to the restaurants so that the person that goes to the restaurant and asks for a plate with a specific name knows what it is and know whether it is in a closed season. They have the information in that placemat that there's closed season and what's the reason for the closed season. Next. So in, in, in summary, the island-based fishery management plans are produced to achieve a stable ecosystem and a sustainable fishing resource. We cannot have sustainability in the resource if we don't have stability in the, in the ecosystem. So we have to know the details of the ecology of the place where you fish. You have to know the impacts of the boats and the fishing gear, and that everyone, not just the fishers, have to respect the management measures, close times, no fishing areas, fishing gear limitations, size limits of the species caught. All this information is from uh, for all the stakeholders, from the mountain to the sea, no matter where the person is eating or buying that fish, 
they should know where it came from and whether it is the space that is allowed or whether it is, it is a restricted uh, species. So that's the end of my presentation. Questions? Great. Thank you so much, Alida. Um, so we'll have uh, time for one or two questions. Lee, do you want to read them out? Yes. First, Alida Diepa y uh, Ivan Montilla le manda saludos. Um, so that's first. Uh, the, a couple of questions. So, of the countries that were reviewed to prepare the island based plans, are there people employed to actually ensure protection of marine protected areas? And if so, how often do they update data? Um, probably that's one of the issues that we have right now in front of us for working. Yes, they are those marine protected areas. We do not have all the information, even though it might be in, in some publication, it might be in some research, on those protected areas and the impact that the closing or the protection has, uh, has had. So that's, that's an issue that just a week ago or two weeks ago, we were discussing with the uh, people from fishers and, and government in the Virgin Islands to work with, you know, Brahmanic Bank, Red Hind the Bank. What's the status of those uh, populations there after they were closed? So we do have the areas protected, but we have not been follow, following them probably with the, with the frequency that it's needed and the fishers are claiming that ha that has to be done okay so that sort of leads into the next question which is what about enforcement of regulations enforcement of regulations okay a when you have the exclusive economic zone the enforcement and regulation there is is, is being done or is done by the, the federal uh, Coast Guard and, and the uh, people that work there. In the territorial areas, it is the Department of Natural Resources, the uh, Vigilantes, and we have many problems, I would say, with enforcement. First, because we have to know, like I said from the very beginning, those uh, species, those species and the, the, the characteristic of the species have to be known by all the, the vigilantes that go in the, in to, to check what the fishers caught. And also we do need the fishers themselves to be more uh, uh, responsible, I would say, with what they are catching and what they are selling. So there might be problems with enforcement in some areas. In, I would say in even all the islands. Okay, great, Doug. Thanks, Alida. Those are the only questions that we had for Alida, Katie, if you're ready to. Ooh. Yes, thank you, Alida, so much um, for your time and for your awesome presentation. Um, we are going to move on to uh, Patricia Kramer. Um, so Patricia, if you would like to Pop on. All right, so our next speaker, uh, Patricia Kramer, um, is a coral reef scientist uh, who has worked in the wider Caribbean uh, for over 15 years. He is the program director of AGRA, the Atlantic and Gulf Rapid Reef Assessment Program, which is an international collaboration dedicated to protecting coral reefs through science, conservation, and education. She is a board member of the Ocean Research and Education Foundation and co-founder and scientific advisor to the Healthy Reefs Initiative. Welcome, Patricia. Hi, good morning, thank you. It's great to be here. Um, as Katie said, I'm with the AGRA program and have been working throughout the Caribbean looking at coral reef health. AGRA is similar to the NCREP program that you heard about earlier and that we um, work with different countries, more than 20 countries in the Caribbean um, to monitor and uh, manage and conserve um, coral reefs. Today I just wanted to focus on one aspect um, that has become a really uh, prominent and important issue in the Caribbean and that's the stony coral tissue loss disease um, and the collaborative monitoring efforts. Uh, specifically I wanted to show some of the new interactive online techniques um, and tools that we've been developing 
and how it helps us to answer several questions that we get from managers, partners, scientists throughout the Caribbean. Uh, one of the questions is, what is stony coral tissue loss disease? And more importantly, you know, is it a concern? There's diseases have been on uh, coral reefs in the Caribbean for uh, many decades. Um, next, but this one um, is very serious. And uh, I kind of wanted to just combine, just and go over real quickly, some of what are the top five reasons why this is one of the most serious uh, coral disease outbreak that we've ever experienced, at least in my lifetime, um, on reefs in the Caribbean. One is that it affects many coral reef species. More than 25 species have been observed to have uh, stony coral tissue loss disease. Uh, on the bright side, um, Acropora species, which were affected uh, in the 70s and 80s by white band disease, have not been affected by stony coral tissue loss disease. Um, but one of the things that it affects is that um, stony coral tissue loss disease causes rapid tissue mortality. Corals are amazing animals. That first picture I showed you, close up of polyps of the corals, they're amazing. They not only provide structure, they provide habitat, but they also can, you know, experience partial mortality. Unlike a lot of other animals and humans, um, they can regrow a lot of their tissue. Uh, but stony coral tissue loss disease is causing such rapid tissue mortality and so much of it that we, um, a lot of the corals are dying within weeks to months. If we dive into this photo, which is from Guadeloupe, a French Caribbean island in the Eastern Caribbean, um, you can see in the background some of the volcanic rocks, which are natural there, the corals attached to those rocks and grow, um, or they settle on the rocks and they grow. And um, if this picture, if you look at it, it's quite different than the last picture in that you see a lot of white. Uh, natural healthy coral tissue is normally brown or greenish, um, but it looks a lot healthier. Here you see a lot of white patches, and those white patches are where the coral has actually died, and the tissue has um, sloughed away. And this is what happens with the disease. It, it um, causes really rapid tissue loss. And in a lot of cases, as I said earlier, 100% mortality. These two coral species here, the brain corals, um, have been affected and more than, lost more than 50% of their tissue. And this is in an early outbreak stage here um, that you're seeing. Um, it also has high transmission rates. It's very uh, contagious. It spreads rapidly across a reef. And if you dive on a reef and you see you'll just, it's, you kind of have like a panic attack. You start seeing a lot of corals that are affected um, with a lot of recent mortality. You see these bright white skeletons. Um, and unlike other diseases, uh, this has a large geographic range. As um, they found out in Florida, where they've been doing an incredible amount of research and science monitoring, um, it is spread throughout the Florida reef tract. Uh, and instead of just looking at a disease outbreak at a reef, like 100 meter square area, we're now looking at tens to hundreds of kilometers of coral reef that have been affected. And unlike other diseases, um, the first disease outbreak that I ever saw was in 1998 in Andros Island in the Bahamas, um, associated with a coral bleaching event. There was a white plague event on just the um, uh, star corals. Um, it started to uh, disappear and go away as the sea surface temperatures started to um, decrease. But stony coral tissue loss disease is very persistent. It's around year round, it's active, and across multiple years. Next. So one of the questions, um, when we know that uh, in Florida, it started about 2014 um, and is still uh, occurring there. Um, but in 2018, we started to get reports um, from uh, colleagues in the Caribbean. Next. Um, and one of the first places was in Jamaica, along the north coast. There are several deeper reefs um, of up 10 meters that started to uh, show signs of coral tissue loss. This photo, um, you can see the white dead area of um, where it's lost tissue. Next. In Mexico, in, uh, in summer of 2018, uh, the first reports from Puerto Morales, um, where they started to see the uh, disease. And it has spread more than 450 kilometers along the entire coastline, Caribbean coastline of Mexico, um, except for Banco Chinchorro, which is an offshore atoll. So it has really spread um, there, uh, like it has in Florida, and has caused um, a loss of more than 30% of coral cover and up to 90% of all of their pillar corals um, they have lost. Next. And on the far eastern side in um, San Martin in the French Islands and the Eastern Caribbean, northern part, um, there are also reports uh, in the northern parts of their island. So you can see here, um, just in 2018, the large range where stony coral tissue loss disease was being reported. Next. In 2019, we started to get more reports. U.S. Virgin Islands, which has an incredible um, monitoring program, response program. Um, I would encourage you to go look at their website because they have great data. 
and been able to track how it first occurred on the uh, western side of St. Thomas and spread towards the east in St. John and just this year on the south coast of St. Croix. Next. In the northern part of the Dominican Republic, there were reports. Next. And if you're looking at the bottom, you can see all of the pictures I'm showing are some representative samples of many different species uh, with um, recent tissue loss. Next. The Turks and Caicos, they found it in um, several parts of Turks and Caicos in West Caicos, South Caicos, and on Grand Turk. And recently in Belize, they were hoping that um, it would not extend past Mexico, but diseases know no borders. Um, they are uh, passed through the currents. Uh, and so um, they found their first reports in uh, 2019 in just the northern part in Bacalar Chico Marine Reserve. Although I was um, in contact with colleagues last night and they are having their first reports of uh, the disease at Lighthouse um, Reef Atoll and just in the northern part there. Next. And there they're losing a lot of their pillar corals, a lot of mortality in pillar corals. Um, also in the Eastern Caribbean and St. Eustatius um, started to move further south. Um, Puerto Rico also started to report, um, have reports on the Eastern or the Eastern side of the island, also in Calabria and Vieques. Next. And also encourage you to look at their website because they have great training materials in Spanish and um, also a great webinar. Um, and then also in 2019 uh, was the Bahamas where the first report was in uh, Grand Bahamas on the West Coast, and it's now been seen also in New Providence on the Northeast Coast. So seven more countries started reporting it just within the year of 2019. Next. In 2020 came, um, we had uh, fewer reports, uh, but we, and I think part of that is not because the disease decided to slow down, but because um, COVID happened and many people were not able to get out and look at their reefs. But we did have some reports um, that are starting to come in, especially as people are able to get back out. Next. Um, and in the British Virgin Islands, um, it has uh, has been observed there, and they're working with the USVI in a great program. They uh, set up a task force so that they can uh, meet regularly to address uh, what is happening there. Next. Um, also in the Cayman Islands, it was reported there. Uh, the, um, they did a very quick uh, kind of strike team response where they were able to get out and circumnavigate their whole entire island and um, confirm that it was only on the north coast of the island in about a seven kilometer area, um, similar to Jamaica, both on the north and north sides. Next. Um, and then our two most recent reports are from Guadeloupe uh, in the Eastern Caribbean, the French island of Guadeloupe, um, and next, and then also further south in St. Lucia. So you can see that it's starting to extend down. So, so far, just between 2018 and 2020, we've had um, 15 territories or countries that have reported stony coral tissue loss disease. Um, has not been reported in Honduras, along Colombia, Costa Rica, Panama, or in Bonaire, Curacao, and in the southern part of the Eastern Caribbean, nor in Barbados. Um, so we're hoping that it doesn't spread there. So tracking this has been very, very helpful because um, it helps us understand how extensive this disease is and also the lessons learned. And this has been a great collaborative effort with the um, Florida uh, Disease Advisory Committee and also the Caribbean Cooperation Team that um, Dana Wuzanek Mendez helps to lead. And so, sharing this information, we're able to kind of share lessons learned throughout all these countries. Next. So, one of the other tools that we developed was um, kind of trying to help people understand are there reefs at risk? Which reefs are at risk? There's a lot of reef out there, and a lot of these um, areas don't have a lot of uh, funding or resources or time to get out and look at all the reefs. And so, we took uh, coral data from the Agri database where there was coral uh, data available. And instead of just looking at coral data, we started to separate out those species. Um, one of the patterns that they found is that some of the coral species are, um, show signs earlier, they get infected earlier, like the maize corals, the pillar corals. Um, and so they tend to be like the early, um, early corals that get affected. So we were able to pull out the data and kind of uh, make a hotspot map. So um, to kind of highlight those areas, the picture you see here is a pillar coral. It's highlighting an area in the southeastern Bahamas where the, um, there are a lot of pillar corals there. So if you're uh, concerned about that particular species, um, that is one area you could focus your um, surveys on. Next. Um, this is a picture, of, a beautiful picture of a humongous uh, large uh, orbicella uh, coral with a diver. You can see how big it is. Um, and one of the concerns is, especially when it comes to trying to treat some of these corals, is kind of protect those big kind of old growth um, corals. 
And some of the uh, research coming out of Florida is that those um, treatments with antibiotics are, have been effective. Um, so, but in areas where they don't have the disease or if they're trying to find out where the disease has spread, um, they're able to use these maps. Um, one example is in uh, the Bay Islands in Honduras, the Roatan Marine Park, um, in conjunction with uh, MPA Connect, um, are looking at all of the reefs around there. But instead of going to every reef, they kind of prioritized and looked at just those reefs um, where some of those most susceptible corals are as a starting point. They don't have it yet, but they're doing some great um, pre-monitoring. Next. So in order to get all of this information, we uh, very quickly had to build a database. Agra um, hosts a database for uh, the regular um, metrics for uh, monitoring for coral and benthic and fish surveys. Um, but this was something different that a lot of people were just going out and doing river diving surveys or were just doing kind of presence absence surveys. So we, um, we use a lot of ArcGIS online tools to develop this. This was a quick, easy way. We developed a survey form um, and we uh, kind of modeled it after the uh, programs in Florida and the USDI where they have um, kind of their coral reef watch or bleach watch. And we um, did this so that people could enter their data. And this is kind of a, a, a few step process. It's just not that the data goes in, but um, you submit reports, we ask for photos, videos, and it collects data on which species are being affected. And then um, uh, Judy Lang and myself with Agra, and then we also work with um, coral experts in Florida and also with the Caribbean Cooperation Team, review those. And it's kind of a long process sometimes because looking at a photo um, just doesn't tell you everything. So a lot of times we'll have um, our colleagues go back out and collect more information. But once the information is confirmed, um, either present or absent, it shows up. And what's great about this is that all of this information is fed into a map uh, real time. Um, just recently, uh, which should be available soon, is that we've added uh, bleaching to this as well, um, because there have been reports from Florida and some other areas where some of those corals that have, um, have stony coral tissue loss disease also are showing bleaching. So this allows you by species to enter data that you can put both disease data and bleaching data. And this is really important because it helps to guide response and management actions. Um, next. So I'm just going to take you through real quickly, kind of a uh, fly through, walk through of um, the online data map. Um, if you haven't used ArcGIS maps, they're great. Here it just looks like a 1D map, but these are 3D, and I really encourage you to kind of dive into it. Next. <coughs> um, as you can see up on the upper left hand side, there is a toolbar and you can click on the legend and it shows you what um, the different symbols mean. So here we're just using the red, green, yellow and purple for um, if it's present, absent, or if it's under review. There's also different data layers. And this is where the collaboration comes in because Florida already had established a huge um, uh, data and monitoring effort. So they work with you know, dozens of different organizations and the uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission does an amazing job. Their data management team is great and that they compile all this information. And instead of having to re-enter all of the information, we're able to combine the information and they just share it with us. And we just started doing that recently with the USVI as well. And so this kind of gives you a better complete uh, picture of US territories, but also those Caribbean countries. Next. But as I said, this is a 3D map. You can actually dive into it. If you click on a particular dot, you'll get a pop-up map and it shows you the data right away. There's no going through databases and things like that that are hard to, to go through. You just click on the dot, you get the information, who submitted it, where it was, what type of reef it was, what species they had. And also if they submitted pictures, you'll see the pictures. Um, so all those pictures that you saw earlier when I was doing the overview, um, they come from, most of them come from the database. Another thing that you can do is dive into the different layers. Um, for example, if you wanted to know uh, if disease was in your marine protected area, you can click on the layer for marine protected area. Um, or also for shipping routes, um, there's been a lot of interest and question about whether or not uh, the disease is um, transmitted through ballast water. Um, so you can pull up that layer. So I really encourage you um, to find out more. Just don't look at the map as 1D, but really dive into it and to explore it to find out more. Next. But one of the questions was, how do we kind of pull all this information together? And that's something at Ergo we try, try to do is really try to make information useful. Um, and this came out of a, a great collaboration um, with uh, Dana at NOAA and also with the MPA Connect. Um, and this kind of brings all of this dashboard together. And so just real quickly, I'll take you through this. The dashboard summarizes the high level statistics. It also gives maps. Um, next, again, this is a two, uh, 3D thing where you can kind of dive in and find out um, who is doing monitoring, where they're doing education, next. And also those areas, next. 
that are doing um, uh, different treatments. And there's nine countries that are doing treatments. Also gives you the uh, coral species that have been reported. And on the left, there is um, next a map that is a time lapse. And it gives you more of a detail of when diseases were first observed in different countries. Next. Uh, but also, most of the focus has been focused on the corals and how the corals are doing, which is really important. But thinking forward, we have to kind of think of how is the stony coral tissue loss disease going to affect um, the future structure and function of our reefs. And so one of the things that we're uh, in the process and uh, doing is pulling all of the agri data that we have available from over 3,000 sites in the Caribbean over the last 20 years into a story map um, so that people can use it as a baseline uh, to look at how their reefs have changed. Um, and this really trying to think about, you know, we're focused on where the disease is occurring, but really starting to look at, you know, is the loss of structure, particularly the structure of corals, going to affect things like um, uh, shoreline protection or habitat or fish. Um, so try to think forward into this. Next. These are just some of the amazing websites that are out there for Florida, Puerto Rico, USVI, that you can get more information on the disease. Next. Um, on the AGRA website, we've tried to pull all this together. You can find all of the maps, the reporting form, amazing infographics that MPA Connect has made, um, and the, several webinars that we've um, been hosting along with uh, Reef Resilience Network and MPA Connect. Next. And I just want to kind of summarize that, you know, I started off with healthy coral. I'm ending with a healthy coral because um, this is a really serious disease, but I also have hope because um, this has been a huge collaborative collaborative effort. People are sharing information. They're looking for new techniques on how to stop this. Um, you know, restoration is becoming a really key, important part. Um, so I kind of wanted to end on this because I do have hope because I believe in, you know, people and hoping to that they will try to um, come up with new efforts and also that we sometimes surprise us. But we do need to give a helping hand and um, help reduce impacts. And just awesome. a shout out to all my colleagues, uh, Judy Lang, Lynette Roth, and also to everyone who submitted all our data and to all of the larger stony coral tissue loss disease uh, network out there who freely share their information and lessons learned. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Patricia. Um, this was a really great overview of stony coral tissue loss disease and some of these amazing collaborations that are happening. Um, so we are going to um, move on um, to our session two. Um, so we will take about um, a five minute break and then we will get started with that session. All right. Thanks, Patricia.
Hey, Forrest. All right. All right. Well, we will um, kick off our second session. And we have three speakers that are going to um, be talking about hazards and climate resilience. And our first speaker is Forrest Willis. Um, Mr. Willis has been affiliated with the Coast Guard for 36 years, most of that time in some facet of emergency response. He is the co-chair along with EPA of the Caribbean Emergency Response Team. In his current position, Mr. Willis has overall coordination responsibility for the Southeast United States and Caribbean for oil, hazardous materials, and disaster response. Forrest, uh, kick it over to you. Thank you very much. If everyone can hear me okay. Uh, so the first slide that you see here was a recent response in uh, Puerto Rico and Guyana of, of a sailboat. And fortunately, this is the majority of the type of uh, environmental incidents that we get from, from vessels. Um, occasionally, we do get some co large commercial traffic things, but fortunately, we've been very, uh, uh, very fortunate in, in uh, the Caribbean as to what type of events that we've had, uh, knock on wood. However, there have been historically some pretty, pretty major ones. Next slide, please. So just want to kind of update everybody on what the Coast Guard is doing in, in the Caribbean and in terms of environmental work. Uh, so we're out of the Coast Guard District Office in uh, Miami, which covers the whole Southeast US and the Caribbean. And uh, so a lot of our work kind of overshadows each other between what's going on in the Atlantic and, and the Caribbean um, where it comes together. So one of the first things that we're pretty proud of is that is our U.S. and Cuba Joint Contingency Plan, Cubus. So the United States has been working uh, with Cuba for the last three or four years, uh, trying to develop a way to work together, uh, install the uh, political constraints that we have uh, between the two countries. Uh, the two countries came together in 2015 and signed a joint agreement that uh, they wanted to work on environmental issues together to protect against uh, oil and hazardous materials issues. So once that agreement was signed, we started meeting uh, with the Cuban delegation uh, and developed a joint contingency plan, uh, very similar to what we have for our, our regional response team plans. And, and how this will work is uh, should Cuba have a large spill that may potentially impact the U.S., they would notify us. <clears throat> we would send someone to Cuba to be a liaison from the U.S. Uh, vice versa, if we had something that would potentially impact Cuba, then they would uh, send somebody over to the U.S., and that way we would be able to talk face-to-face -face and, and work on issues and joint responses. So. Um, has not been practiced yet. We're hoping that in uh, 2021, once COVID uh, settles down, that we'll be able to- I'm sorry, to Forrest, this is Lee. Forrest, sorry to interrupt. Can you speak just a little bit louder? Some folks are indicating that they're having a little trouble hearing you. Thanks. Sure, okay. I'll get a little closer to the microphone. So they, um, we're planning in 2021 to meet with, with Cuba and develop some long-term planning and uh, exercises, and we think that uh, NOAA and, and all the environmentalists in the area will certainly be uh, this joint has been to um, their environmental sensitive index planning and, and some of the other uh, traditional oil spill activities that we do in advance. So uh, the next one is the Bahamas oil drilling. So Bahamas has announced that uh, probably in late December or early January, they plan to start doing some exploratory well drilling. Um, we don't have a lot of information on, on this yet. It's been kept um, very low key. 
uh, but we are reaching out to the Bahamas to try to see if they're interested in coming up with a, a plan similar to Cubis, which would be a, a joint contingency with the US. Um, we feel like the trajectories that uh, the exports that NOAA have run before that uh, the United States is fairly well protected from uh, the Bahamas event uh, by the Gulf Stream, uh, which is not the case necessarily with Cuba. Um, but again, we are we're hoping to uh, develop that relationship and be able to do exercises, et cetera, with, with the Bahamas in the near future. <clears throat> So the next one is uh, what I think is the very worst act. Go back again, please. <clears throat> the very worst acronym I could ever think of. There must have been a bunch of bureaucrats sat around for a week coming up with this one. <laughs> this is the uh, RAC Ripetec Carib. So that Ripetec stands for Regional Marine Pollution Emergency Information and Training Center, and it is a um, International Maritime Organization, UN sponsored uh, group that is headquartered in Curacao and funded quite a bit by both the Netherlands and the United States. Mm. Uh, we have in the past always had a Coast Guard officer uh, seconded to them in Curacao. But recent developments, we started looking at the cost of uh, flights, et cetera. To, for that person to be able to serve all the other areas within the Caribbean and found out it's actually more efficient and both cost-wise and time-wise for them to be located in Washington, D.C. And, and fly out on commercial carriers to these locations. So the decision was made to move that person to D.C. this year, but uh, really his participation and activities uh, should be seamless to everyone. Uh, should, should not make a difference whether they're in D.C. or in, in Curacao, and probably will actually improve the program overall. Next thing I want to talk about is support the FEMA for hurricane response and the Coast Guard's uh, response uh, to hurricanes in general. <clears throat> so Hurricane Irma and Maria were very uh, devastating hurricanes in terms of people with small boats and small commercial vessels and created a large cleanup issue for us, both in the Puerto Rico and the U U.S. Virgin Islands. <clears throat> so uh, for the U.S. Virgin Islands, there were 477 vessels that were either uh, sunken or displaced. And it cost over $33 million to clean up those 477 vessels. In Puerto Rico, we have 375 vessels and 35 million. And it becomes very expensive to uh, clean up and respond to vessels within the islands just because there's not a lot of infrastructure. Uh, they have to bring a lot of the salvage companies from the, from the mainland US to come in and, and help. Uh, in the Virgin Islands, we had to, uh, there was no landfill for all the vessels that had to be cut up. So they had to be put on barges and then brought back to the US for the disposal. So where this gets kind of funny and people criticize the, the Coast Guard quite a bit is um, on our pollution responses. On in occasion, we have to just take off the pollutants and leave the vessels. It's not something we want to do, but it's required. It's the only thing we can do by law, depending on the circumstance. So all our pollution responses uh, guided by the uh, National Contingency Plan and, and the Oil Spill Liability Trust Fund. The way the Oil Spill Liability Trust Fund works is the, uh, the captain of the port, federal on-scene coordinator, uh, has the authority to tap into federal monies to respond to, to sunken vessels to remove the pollutants. But the law does not give the authority to remove the vessels. So on occasion, uh, we have to just take the pollutants off and drop the vessel back where it's at or leave it where it's at and then it becomes the responsibility of the territory or the commonwealth to decide what to do with that vessel. Um, the other thing is it's a strict liability law. So if we know who the uh, owner of those vessels are and the U.S. 
spends uh, his money, he's the OLSTF, and we're obligated by law to go after the uh, owner of that vessel to recover the cost of, of uh, depolluting de it, which could be uh, very significant money in, in the Caribbean. Um, and then the person that would have you know, the responsibility for having to to pay that or, or fight it in court. <clears throat> so a preferred response during hurricanes is to work under admission assignment to FEMA under the Stafford Act. And what the Stafford Act does is it allows um, FEMA to contract with the Coast Guard or the EPA to respond to uh, hazardous materials and oil events <clears throat> on behalf of this or request of the state of the Commonwealth. So then we're able to uh, depollute the vessels if, as required and respond to that. But we are also able to work closer with um, Army Corps of Engineers or Commonwealth uh, or territory, whoever happens to be to place those vessels, take them out of the environment and place them somewhere but then it's the responsibility of, of uh, FEMA or the ter territorial commonwealth to dispose of those vessels. That way they come out of the environment altogether. The downside to that particular law is then the commonwealth, the territory becomes responsible for a portion of that funding. So uh, depending on what that portion is, normally it's 25% under any uh, relationship with FEMA under admission assignment that can be modified. Irma Maria was dropped to like 10% 10, 10 I believe. But 10% uh, of 33 million is is still quite a hump for the uh, parent to have to lodge up to pay. Uh, so I guess the bottom line message there is boat owners really need to look at having insurance that can pay for uh, whatever event there is. A lot of people don't want to pay that extra money, but it will certainly, it's like a, having car insurance. It'll save you a lot of money on the back end if your boat should happen to sink as a result of the storm. Next slide, please. So some other things that the Caribbean Regional Response Team are doing. So the Caribbean Response Team is a group that was formed uh, in the, early 90s as a result of the uh, Oil Pollution Act of 1990. And it required at federal trustees, of which NOAA is one of the federal trustees, uh, along Coast Guard and EPA comes together periodically to develop plans, provide training, and look at how to respond to um, events that may occur. And most of the time when we meet, we try to meet twice a year um, for all our regional response team meetings, which are programmed meetings. But we are also have what are called incident specific regional response team activations. So if there's an event that occurs, say <clears throat> the motor vessel Jai Ray is a good example that occurred uh, a few years ago on Mona Island. There are a lot of environmental impacts and considerations uh, with that particular vessel. We were able to put together calls periodically with all the key trustees and, and consultants to come up with a response plan to respond and to remove that vessel uh, from Mona Island. So those are you know, pop-up events, but that's what the CRT is there for. It's to support the federal on-scene commander in coming up with um, the best response uh, plan, best management plan for that event as needed. So <clears throat> some of the future activities that we have going on is we're looking at our Navassa Island response plan. We have a plan that's been sitting there for probably 20 years at least on how to respond to Navassa Island. Uh, Navassa Island is basically uninhabited and sits in between three other islands and it's not close to anything. Uh, so, but we're going back and looking at that to make sure that we're able to um, have the proper response if and when it's needed. 
The next thing we want to do is updating our agreement with the British Virgin Islands. We have an agreement with them that we've had for several years. The BVI is a great partner. They come in and attend our CRRT meetings, <clears throat> uh, but we have not had a lot of communication with the BVI since uh, Marie and Irma. And we want to go back and talk to them about what they've learned in terms of their lessons from the, from the hurricane response, as well as us, and make sure that we're able to assist each other as good partners in another event. Uh, next thing we're doing is an update for our consultation for dispersant in situ burns. This is a requirement to, for us to consult on these before we develop our dispersant and in situ burn plans. Um, our consultation was approved a couple of years ago by uh, NOAA, National Marine Fishery Services and Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, so we just need to go in now and update it for new species that have been identified and see if we need to make any changes. Uh, then finally, uh, virtual CRT meetings. We've actually pushed back against that for uh, several years because um, we think that there's a lot of value in getting together periodically uh, with the teams from the mainland coming down to the islands and doing network and, and finding out face-to-face -face what the issues are and, and be able to go out to uh, do field visits, etc. We haven't been able to do much this year because of COVID. So we were looking at probably after the first year holding a virtual CRRT meeting with all the key partners so we can stay in touch and uh, hopefully get back on track and, and have an interim mechanism until we can actually get back to doing uh, uh, face-to-face -face RRT meetings. There are some advantages to, this, to the virtual. It, uh, more people will probably be able to attend as well as uh, the cost. There's a lot of cost for bringing people from the mainland down and the federal budgets, as everyone knows, are getting cut quite drastically. So uh, this virtual CRRT may be another tool that we're using periodically in the future. And I think that's all I've got, if there are any questions. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Forrest, um, for the presentation and the overview of the uh, CRRT. Um, with that, we're going to um, move over to our next speaker, uh, Eric Brown. All right. All right, um, Eric Brown is a senior hydraulic engineer with the Federal Highway Administration's Office of Bridges and Structures. Some of his current focus areas are culvert design, highway drainage, nature-based solutions for highway resilience, and the FHWA Rivers and Roads Connection Program to develop practical tools and training for transportation professionals to apply in riverine environments. Welcome, Eric. Thank you, Katie, for all the help with the logistics and keeping things moving along. And thank you, Noah, for the invite. And I want to thank uh, Tina Hodges, my colleague, and uh, her contract staff for putting these slides together. Tina is now actually with NOAA. She's moved on from Federal Highway to NOAA. So um, I am here in her stead. And I am a hydraulic engineer, so I, I deal with designing uh, infrastructure uh, to account for uh, moving water. And I don't actually have a lot of coastal background, uh, which actually is appropriate because that's lacking in the Federal Highway Administration and also uh, among our partner state departments of transportation and local departments of transportation. And so what I wanna present here very quickly, I'll move through these slides very quickly. This is a teaser. I wanna give you an idea of where uh, the departments of transportation are at as far as nature-based solutions and, and working in coastal environments. And this may help you be better uh, prepared to partner with these agencies uh, in the future. And I, I can say they would love to be partners in these activities. Uh, next slide, please, Katie. So we, we have a heavy focus in Federal Highway on resilience. And actually, when we're coming up with new programs and activities, we try to tie them to resilience. Um, among us, uh, not confidentially, but I think the political landscape has a shine away from language that's couched in terms of climate change and whatnot. So we do focus heavily on resilience and we tie resilience into safety and infrastructure condition and protection of the natural environment in these activities. Uh, next slide, please. 
So we, in the last, I would say, even less than a decade, we have developed a lot of resources. And again, this is a teaser. I don't, poss I don't have time to possibly go into any detail on, on most of these. But you'll see a web link, and I highly encourage you to check out these different um, resources. There's a lot of pilot projects. Our pilot projects don't uh, really go to the point of seeing a project constructed and then monitored. But we do, uh, in our pilot projects, get to a lot of conceptual designs and lessons learned. So please check these out, and this will give you more of an idea of, of what transportation agencies are working with and wrestling with. Uh, one that I want to highlight is the nature-based solutions in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, next slide, please. So we have uh, recently focused heavily on nature-based solutions in the coastal environment, and we'll be doing a similar activity in the riverine environment. And of course, uh, historically, in the upper left-hand corner there, you know, as an engineering entity and representing other engineering entities, we have done a lot of structural solutions that haven't really done uh, justice for our natural environment and our coastlines. Um, so we recognize that there's a need to go more towards nature-based solutions uh, that also have the opportunity to change and adjust to rising sea level and other uh, climatic uh, non-stationarity. Um, Unfortunately, we're also looking at situations where we have to start looking at policy solutions. I live here in Maryland, and uh, we have a, uh, a county, Dorchester County. Um, and if you're interested in a YouTube link on Dorchester County and their, pro their potential need to retreat from the coastline due to sea level rise, uh, send me an email and I'll get you that link. It's a, it's a fascinating YouTube video. Uh, it's, it's less than an hour. But unfortunately, uh, some of our coastal communities um, uh, are looking at the potential to having to retreat uh, from the shoreline. Uh, next slide, please. So the nature-based solutions, uh, it's a great read. Uh, the comprehensive program focused on pilot projects, and again, those usually go to conceptual design, but we don't actually see projects built uh, just because of the funding mechanism and the time constraints. There's an associated white paper and, and peer exchanges and an implementation guide that I really would like uh, for you to download and take a look at. Uh, it, it's meant for a core audience of, depart of departments of transportation and their staff. So it doesn't get into a lot of the high end uh, technical nitty gritty that you probably deal with on a daily basis just because our transportation agencies aren't there um, from a technical standpoint and from an experience standpoint. Uh, next slide, please. So this implementation guide uh, has fact sheets. Uh, uh, our contractor attempted to do some you know, benefits uh, and typical cost analyses. A lot of implementation considerations that our Department of Transportation partners uh, have to deal with. Next slide, please. So I think most of you are probably familiar with some of the typical candidates of, uh, or, or what's in the toolbox for nature-based solutions, uh, beach nourishment, uh, reefs, uh, wetlands and marshes, uh, maritime and mangrove forests, and things of those nature. Uh, that Those types of things are addressed in this implementation guide. Next. So, yeah, we, we try to highlight in there um, the carrots, you know, why why nature-based solutions in the coastal environment are important and how they may protect our, our coastal infrastructure, our roads and bridges. And it's not that the transportation agency staff themselves need the carrots. They want to do the right thing and they realize the importance of this, but they're under strict limitations on what they can use funding for and uh, what types of activities they can build into a project. Uh, they may be working within lim limited right away, and that's mo more, most often the case. So they have to be very conscious of what activities uh, they obligate themselves to and making sure that they can use, especially the federal aid uh, funds that we provide, that, that they fit into um, their mission and their goals. Next slide. So the next series of these three slides just give you an idea of some of the content of uh, this implementation guide. 
and again, it's conceptual in nature, um, and it's meant for an audience that doesn't necessarily have uh, a robust technical background in coastal science and coastal engineering and coastal ecology. So uh, we'll just go through these next uh, real quickly. If you could flip through the next uh, couple, uh, Katie. Okay. Pocket beaches, uh, this is kind of a neat one. Um, this is more of a hybrid approach with these uh, these breakwaters that are constructed out of probably more conventional materials and then uh, the beach fill that, uh, that, max, that uh, takes place in between these. Okay, next please. So as a Department of Transportation, um, you know, this is, these are the considerations and kind of the processes in their typical project development and deployment. Planning and funding, uh, there's not a lot of funding to do these uh, nature-based solution projects. And that's where the partnerships really come into play. They don't have the technical background, either from the ecology, the engineering, or other science type uh, uh, backgrounds to do even you know the site assessments. That's typically not uh, skill sets that transportation agencies, surface transportation agencies, departments uh, have. And the same thing with the design. Most departments of transportation do not have coastal engineers and coastal science uh, coastal scientists on staff. Uh, permitting can be an issue uh, and a struggle. Um, they may want to do these, but there may be a local or a state or a federal agency that says, well. That sounds like a good idea, but we're not going to allow you to uh, put fill in uh, to do beach nourishment or, you know, many of these other types of activities that require um, bringing in materials. Uh, construction and monitoring, uh, most departments of transportation do not have funding and it's not within their mission to do long-term monitoring of projects. So if you're looking to partner with these agencies, these are some of the considerations and, and some of the things that they would need uh, their partners to bring to the table. Next slide, please. All right, so yeah, it's all about partnerships like I've been talking about. NOAA has been a great partner. Uh, we consider NOAA and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, two of the experts on uh, nature-based solutions in the coastal environment, and we're very thankful for their help. But it, it requires uh, a lot of agencies working with the Department of Transportation to make these projects viable. Next slide, please. So again, transportation professionals in summary, they do a lot of good things. Uh, they are great at planning. Uh, they're great at um, you know, the engineering and coming up with the detailed drawings and things. They do not have the coastal engineers and the coastal scientists. They're not NOAA, they're not the Army Corps. They just don't have these skill sets and they need their partners to bring these to the table. And with that, the next slide, um, I will wrap up. And so thank you so much for this opportunity. Again, this was just a teaser. Um, I highly encourage you to check out these various resources. Uh, the Nature-Based Solutions Guide is at this website right here. And with, with your further questions, feel free to drop me an email at any time. And if you would like um, a longer discussion on any of these topics, I can also pull in my colleagues from our Sustainable Transportation and Resilience team, and we'd be very happy uh, to partner with you in the future. Thank you so much, Katie and audience and Noah. Awesome, thanks so much, Eric. Lee, do we have um, some questions for Eric? We do, we have a couple. So the first one is, are there structural solutions for a highway or other transportation system of roads for quick evacuation? Because for example, in Puerto Rico, some roads and highways that are needed to evacuate communities are flooded and there's no high ground or high structures nearby, so people would be trapped. That's a great question. Um, I think this deserves follow up for sure. Um, we can probably come up with some creative ideas and I would bet um, that the Army Corps of Engineers probably has some tricks up their sleeve as well. Uh, some, some of these structural um, solutions uh, can actually adjust to changing conditions and sea level rise and storm surge. And then when the threat has passed, um, they can be lowered or removed, uh, et cetera, to get back to more normal operating procedures. So there's probably a host of tools out there. And uh, if, as we need to, let's follow up on that and bring in other folks to talk about it. Great. The other question is, 
if you can point people towards cost benefit analyses on using nature based solutions and also the extra costs associated with building in resilience up front. That is something that's in high demand. We have limited information and, and we know that costs change um, day by day almost. Uh, and so we have a little bit of that information in this, this nature-based uh, guide for coastal highways. I actually believe NOAA probably has a lot of that type of information as well as, as well as the Army Corps. So this is not a satisfactory answer. Please look in our guide, um, but uh, we can also help you track down some resources that both NOAA and the Army Corps of Engineers may have. Great, thanks. Those are actually the only questions that we had for Eric here, and I don't see any more coming in. Well, great, Eric. Um, we'll be sure to um, share your contact information for any follow-up questions. Thank you so much. All right, and then with that, we have one more presentation to uh, round out our hazards and climate resilience session. So it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Carlos Fuller. Um, he is a regional and international liaison officer at the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center. His primary responsibility is to coordinate CARICOM member states in the international climate change negotiations. He is presently the chief negotiator on climate change for the Alliance of Small Island States under the chairmanship of Belize. He is a member of the WMO Standing Committee on Climate Services and serves on the Climate Policy Subcommittee of its Climate Coordination Panel. Welcome, Carlos. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Katie, and thanks to the steering committee for inviting me uh, to make this presentation. And I thought I'd use it uh, to introduce the work of the Center within the Caribbean. Next. So the center was established back in 2002 uh, by the CARICOM heads of government to coordinate the region's response uh, to climate change. Uh, so we are a specialized agency of CARICOM, uh, but on the independent mandate. Uh, so we have a full juridical personality and uh, we are financially independent, meaning that we do not depend on member states for our source of funding, but we need to go out and seek uh, funding through projects uh, and, uh, and uh, other approaches. Next. Our members are all the English speaking countries, uh, islands in the Caribbean, with the three exceptions, Belize on the mainland of Central America and Guyana and Suriname on the Northeast coast of South America. All English speaking except Suriname, which is Dutch and uh, Haiti, which is Francophone. Next. Our work is guided by the regional framework, which was adopted by the CARICOM heads of government back in 2009, which provides us our policy guidance. Next. And there are five pillars which drive our work. The first one, mainstreaming climate change uh, into our sustainable development agenda. Secondly, promoting systems to reduce the vulnerability of the Caribbean to climate change. The third, uh, using uh, prudent use of our forests and wetlands to reduce our emissions uh, of greenhouse gases. Uh, fourthly, promoting uh, the use of renewable energy and cutting down the importation of carbon uh, intensive uh, products. And then finally, uh, promoting uh, so specific adaptation measures to address the impacts of climate change within the Caribbean. Next. Uh, we also then have an implementation plan, uh, which was developed through stakeholder engagements with all our member states, but also with the regional specialized agencies uh, in the Caribbean and with academia. Uh, and then the implementation plan has specific actions uh, and the agencies which are responsible for actually implementing these, uh, these specific uh, projects and programs. Next. So these are the seven sectors uh, in which the center works. And of course, they're all interrelated, coastal and marine uh, uh, issues, energy, forest management, agriculture and food security, health and tourism. But water is at the center of it. 
unless we can address the issue of water, either too little water or too much water uh, within the Caribbean, then we cannot address any of the other areas. And that is where a lot of our work is now focused in water and then its impacts on the other sectors. And next. Uh, the center does not pretend to uh, be the expert in all areas. So we have many of our regional agencies who are our implementing partners. So CEDIMA is the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Response Agency, CARFA, the Caribbean uh, Public Health Authority, CARDI, the Caribbean Agricultural and uh, Research and Development Institute, CIMH in Barbados, the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydro Hydrology, and our regional uh, university, University of the West Indies, University of Belize, University of Guyana, and a very important uh, partner is also INSMED, the Institute of Meteorology in Cuba. Next. Uh, next. Next slide, please. Uh, so, so one of the areas uh, in which we do work uh, is, uh, could you go back, uh, is um, in, um, in setting up uh, monitoring systems across the Caribbean. One of the first monitoring systems uh, we did, uh, if you could go back one more, uh, was putting in uh, sea level monitoring stations across the Caribbean to monitor sea level rise. Uh, we then follow that up by putting in a network of core systems. Uh, these are uh, systems to monitor tectonic movement tied in to a tide gauge nearby. So we could actually monitor relative sea level rise. Uh, we have put in uh, cruise stations uh, across the Caribbean and also uh, over 200 uh, weather stations, primarily automatic weather stations uh, across the Caribbean. Next. So this is one of the cruise stations uh, which uh, was uh, uh, installed a couple of years ago offshore Belize. And I know Joe, the next speaker, will be speaking a lot more about uh, the cruise uh, network across the Caribbean. Next. We have set up a, net, a consortium of climate modelers across the Caribbean, uh, the Climate Change Center in Belize, uh, in Jamaica, Cuba, Barbados, Suriname, uh, Trinidad and Tobago, and in Dominican Republic, where we, um, we uh, put in the uh, experiments and we then run the models uh, using various scenarios, using different uh, drivers uh, for the models. And we now have over 20 different scenarios of climate change at resolutions ranging from 50, 25 down to 10 kilometer resolutions and using about four different uh, drivers uh, of climate uh, to see projections out to 2100. Next. And so this is one of the examples uh, of uh, of the modeling outputs uh, that we have uh, out to uh, the year 2099 on changes of precipitation, showing that the northern half of the Caribbean uh, will be getting drier using uh, various models, whether it's a European model, uh, the Hadley Center model, and uh, various scenarios, whether it is the A2 or the B2 uh, models. Next. Uh, we uh, develop uh, and uh, execute training workshops in this case, it was on the use of uh, agricultural models, the Magic Sengen, uh, PRC uh, drivers, and for the WOFOS and the DSAT model, uh, which we use to train agricultural specialists in the Caribbean countries, but also uh, the CARDI, the, the Caribbean Agricultural and Development and, uh, and Training Institute in Trinidad and Tobago. Next. Through that workshop, uh, we then uh, developed a workbook on, uh, on how to do uh, impact assessments of agriculture across the Caribbean. Next. Um, we now have developed a climate uh, online risk assessment tool. This was designed specifically for uh, the, uh, the financial sector, in pri primarily ministries of finance and economic development in governments, so that they can assess how uh, funding for various programs uh, could be affected uh, by climate change, uh, but it is also now being used by uh, NGOs across the Caribbean uh, and even now by some banks because many of their investments uh, and their loans are targeted to sectors like agriculture, which could be impacted by climate change. And so this then provides them with a climate risk assessment besides a financial risk assessment that they can now uh, use uh, as they, uh, as they uh, see how their money is being uh, used wisely. Next. 
We have uh, also a Kariwig uh, portal, uh, which is used and um, it provides the historical data for weather stations across the Caribbean, and that is then tied into projections of a specific station into what it will look like into the future. Uh, and so that is used uh, to, uh, to provide, uh, uh, is, you can use for studies and it is freely available uh, online. Uh, it also has a, a, a hurricane uh, portal. Uh, so all historical hurricanes that have passed through the Caribbean, um, the trajectory can be changed uh, uh, and the angle of incidence into any country can be changed to see how if, if a historical hurricane, if it were to affect, uh, affect a different country on a different scenario would impact them. Next. And then there's also a drought uh, tool within uh, within the um, that model also, which can show uh, the impacts of droughts uh, on the Caribbean. Next. Next. Uh, we have uh, done. Um, if you could go back one. Uh, working in Guyana uh, to develop an agricultural policy uh, on climate change uh, for the Ministry of Agriculture in Guyana through uh, a consultancy. Next. And then we do specific adaptation projects within the Caribbean. In this case, uh, in St. Lucia, using a study from Georgia Tech, which showed that uh, hurricane strengths would uh, increase uh, in Saint, over St. Lucia by some 15%. We then uh, got the services of a wind engineer to see how we could translate that into a strength of wind over St. Lucia. That was then used to, uh, to strengthen the building code in, in St. Lucia. And we then used a building which was going to be retrofitted and which is a hurricane shelter and communication center uh, in St. Lucia using this new building code. And so the Marchand building uh, at the top, it shows you what it was, looked like before. And at the bottom, what it does now, uh, how it looks now after it has been retrofitted. So besides making it stronger, uh, it now has an independent power source using solar panels and an independent water supply. So the system, uh, the center can continue working even after uh, a major hurricane uh, has struck the island. Next. Uh, in St. Vincent, the issue here uh, on the island of Bekwe was that during the dry season, that island, uh, uh, the water supply ran short and water had to be barged in from the main island of St. Vincent. In this case, we installed a reverse osmosis system. Uh, and because it is a very energy intensive, we then also provided an over-engineered a photovoltaic system which is tied into the island's uh, electrical supply and whatever energy is then extracted from the uh, from the um, from the uh, central uh, electrical company um, the excess is then sold back into the uh, power system and that uh, excess uh, funding is then used to maintain the system because we found one of the worst things to provide to any community was a system which had no sustainability and which would then fail uh, in uh, four or five years because there was no uh, funding to maintain the system, whether it was filters, uh, batteries, or whatever, to keep running the system. Next. Uh, in also in St. Lucia, the issue here was that uh, the Coconut Bay uh, Resort was a major user of water and uh, it was the second consumer of water in the, Fort, uh, in the Viewfort area. And so here um, we transformed the, um, the water catchment system where um, the uh, rainwater was harvested, cleaned, uh, and then used uh, to provide water to the system. And even the gray water was also cleaned and that was then used uh, for irrigating uh, the landscape of the system. Uh, and then uh, it turns out that uh, the user, uh, and it was a 50-50 uh, system between uh, grant funding and funding from the resort itself. And they found that this was the greatest invest investment they ever made because they now had a, a, a safe, supply of water, which was available throughout the year, but the expense of buying water from the municipal authority had been reduced significantly. Next. Uh, in various countries uh, in the Eastern uh, Caribbean, East Caribbean, Caribbean, we have a SIF, we have a SIF a C project, a project um, which, uh, uh, which uh, strengthens the resilience of the core and, uh, and improves yeah. the marine protected areas there. 
And then finally, one last slide. Um, I think uh, in uh, Southern Belize, we work with the Mayan community uh, to reduce their uh, flash, uh, the slash and burn systems using protected agriculture uh, for uh, cacao production uh, in, uh, in uh, Belize, uh, which then uh, strengthens the watershed of the area and reduces um, uh, impacts of uh, fertilizers and so on uh, into the um, coastal uh, um, marine resources in the area. And in conclusion, I'd like, just like to uh, point out that uh, uh, we really welcome this interaction uh, with uh, NOAA, and it actually fits in very nicely with the U.S. Fourth Assessment Report on Climate Change, uh, which spoke about uh, about um, the islands of Puerto Rico and the USVI working uh, with the center and with the CIMH in Barbados uh, because of the impacts of climate change uh, on, and natural disasters which affect Puerto Rico and uh, the USVI also affect the other uh, islands in the Caribbean and uh, we need to work together uh, to strengthen our, res our resilience. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Carlos. Um, Lee, I believe we have a question. Yes, we do. At yes, first, I do. At first, I do, Carlos, because, Carlos, his, because he actually, actually, the, the, the participated participate in the 2012, 2012, 2012, 2012, 2012 workshop. So, so, I think you might yeah. need to show up your mic, too, or we're getting some feedback. Thanks. So, Carlos, Krista von Hillebrand Andrade, who I believe you know, sends you a welcome and has a question. Over the past few years, we have rises and falls in sea level data availability in the Caribbean. The IOC, UNESCO, Caribe, WS, not sure what that is, but I'm sure you know, has noted that it has been particularly challenging for the SIDS and LDC to maintain these stations, which has an impact on tsunami warning and climate change. How do you believe this should be addressed? Uh, thank you very much for the question, Krista, and it is good to hear uh, from you, uh, even though through an interpreter. Um, but uh, indeed, this is an issue, and uh, we have now brought it up uh, at several meetings, especially uh, with WMO and with the IOC. We know funding agencies love to install new systems, but they are very hesitant of providing support to maintain systems. And we are now working to convince them it is cheaper to maintain an existing system that has 5, 10, or 15 years of uh, historical data than to try to uh, put in a new system and then complain that, well, we don't have enough, we don't have a 10, 20, 30, or 40 year, uh, uh, you know, uh, a source of data and so uh, we are really now speaking with our partners to say look it is cheaper for you to invest in um, in maintaining a system uh, providing uh, this the, um, the hardware and the software to maintain systems up to date and even to provide the resources for boats um, for um, for fuel uh, for uh, the communities to maintain the systems which we have installed great thanks Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Carlos. We appreciate your uh, participation and we look forward to uh, further collaboration with you. All right. Our next speaker is Leia Mupa Segi. Um, she is a Canaus Marine Policy Fellow with Geo Blue Planet, hosted by NOAA NESDA Satellite Oceanography and Climatology Division. She facilitates partnerships that bridge the gap between Earth observation data and services to deliver usable information to decision makers. Her work supports GeoBlue Planet's engagement with global policy frameworks, such as the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, the UN 2030 Agenda, and UFCCC. Welcome, Leia. Thanks for that intro, Katie. Um, go ahead and click on the next one. So today I'm going to be talking about how GeoBlue Planet facilitates partnerships on sargassum and oil spills in the Caribbean. And I represent GEO Blue Planet, and GEO stands for the Group on Earth Observations. And so this is an intergovernmental organization that connects Earth observations from on the ground to in space uh, to societal issues. And Blue Planet is an initiative of GEO, and we specifically link ocean and coastal information with society. And so we have these 10 thematic areas that we work in, and it's represented on the globe here. And the work I'm talking about today relates to our work on disaster warning and mitigation. Next. So sargassum has been an issue in the Caribbean since 2011. And if you're unfamiliar, um, for the past decade, almost a decade, 
there have been these floating mats of algae that have grown tremendously and it spans from West Africa through the Caribbean. And when they land on shore, they could create these mounds that are, are bigger than people. And so this has been an annual event. And in 2017, member countries of IO Caribe, and so this is the IOC subcommission of the Caribbean and adjacent regions. Um, these member states have come to IO Caribe to say that this is an issue. And we ask that IO Caribe and their partners, including Blue Planet, um, create an operational region-wide information and forecasting system for sargassum and oil spills, and to develop a guide on best management strategies for sargassum events in the coastal environment. Next. And so from stakeholder engagement workshops, we heard that people wanted um, an integrated monitoring approach. They wanted a best management practices guide. The, there were a lot of activities that have started since 2011 throughout the Caribbean. And so um, though there was a lot of work happening, it was all disconnected. So people wanted help with networking as well as a centralized access to information. Next. So a couple months ago, we, including our partners, IO Caribe, Atlantos, and the Air Center, launched the Sargassum Information Hub. And this includes information about sargassum in the tropical Atlantic. So at first, our involvement with sargassum started in the Caribbean through IO Caribe. Um, but because this is also a problem in West Africa, we are now taking this basin-wide approach. And so this sargassum hub provides um, information on sargassum. It's also helping to facilitate networking and to hopefully prevent the duplication of efforts. Next. So some parts that, of the hub include bulletins and reports, including the NOAA USF experimental bulletin, viewers and forecasting systems, including NOAA's Coast Watch Ocean Viewer, as well as um, apps where you could take a photo of Sargassum and note where you found it. Next. To facilitate cl um, collaborations and networking, we've set up this directory and it comes in two parts. So the first is to map organizations and groups involved in sargassum monitoring and management. Um, so if you click on one of these dots, you can see information about an organization and go to their website to see what they do with sargassum. And I note that there is missing information for West Africa. So we're really pushing for people to put in their information here. Next. So from this map, you could actually click on a button and it leads you to this Excel file of organizations that work on Sargassum. So if you wanted to, you could download this as a CSV. Next. We're also trying to create a directory of experts involved in all research in Sargassum. And so we are working through IOC Ocean Expert to create a repository of experts in this field. And so same as before, you could click on one of these circles and find an expert in an area that you're interested in. Next. And then another part of the hub includes um, the ocean best practices system. And so this is a way to collate best practices of anything sargassum related. So whether it's management for your hotel um, coastline or best practices on how to analyze satellite information. And so you could go through this repository and search um, Sargassa Management Caribbean Cleanup, and then you could get a list of practices on Sargassa Cleanup. Next. And so we're really encouraging people to upload their best practices um, because it helps increase visibility of the work. And so, not only can you get more people coming to your document, but we also provide a DOI so that if people use it, it could be referenced. And so there's a meeting going on right now for ocean best practices. And we have a working group specifically on Sargassum to talk about how we could take all these different practices and have a community um, approve a best practice. And so that is happening this moment. Next. And so this hub is part of this greater project um, that we're working on with our partners to 
create a integrated monitoring and forecasting approach. Next. So this starts with in situ validation of satellite products. So we want to know that like what we see on satellite is what's happening on the ground. Um, and we're also going to improve data collection app. So again, being able to take a picture of Sargassum and then um, putting information of where it's found. Next. We're increasing monitoring and forecasting. And this is work with NOAA Atlantic Oceanographic and Meteorological Laboratory. And so we want to increase monitoring both in time and space so that we are covering areas um, that we know we have data gaps from and increasing um, kind of the frequency of when we um, observe them to make sure that we're closing any gaps of information. Next. And then we want to create a best management practices guide. And this is going to be in different languages that shows the different ways that you can manage sargassum on your coast. Next. And so the second half of the work we're doing with Io Caribe is making a wider Caribbean oil spill information system. So we heard from member states that when an oil spill happens somewhere, they need to know what happens, how do you communicate with other countries, and what is kind of that chain of command to handle an oil spill. And so this is in partnership with Amerigio Io Caribe, NOAA Satellite Analysis Branch here in NESDIS, and Ramp Repotech. Next. And so we just had a workshop in July, and now we're on the data collection stage. So the type of information we're looking for is anything oil industry related, where, whether it's locations of oil refineries and tanker terminals to contact information within the different Iocribe countries. And so if you know how to get this information, um, please reach out. Next. And then lastly, we're starting a project, a pilot project with Venezuela. Uh, we received these images um, of these pictures of an oil spill on the coast. And then we've looked through our satellite images and found that we indeed see, saw this oil spill from space. And so we're trying to see now how we could combine these two parts of the information as well as connections throughout the Caribbean to see how we can make this um, oil spill information system usable for our member countries or for IO Caribe's member countries. And that's it. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Leia. Um, do we have a question for Leia, Lee? We do. So Leia, do you see it as feasible? And I think you might have answered this a little bit with your oil spill presentation part, but do you see it as feasible to integrate or use elements of the Sargassum hub for other coastal hazard warning services like oil spills, storm surge, hurricanes, tsunamis, et cetera? SIDS and LDC often note that their limited resources make it difficult to maintain and train different systems and platforms. So could they take advantage of something like their Sargassum Hub? Definitely, and I would say that we're actually taking lessons from the group right now escapes me, but there is already like a tsunami warning type hub um, that we're modeling our oil spill information system and our Sargassum Hub after. Um, so there are definitely, lessons to be shared amongst these different hazard information and warning systems. So I guess the question is more, is there any um, thought of actually integrating them so that it was more a bit of a one-stop shop? That's a good question. And I don't know enough about how NOAA operates to understand how to integrate these things, although I know that NOAA Coast Watch does provide different types of information that would be related to these different hazards. Um, so whether or not we could create a system that connects not only these oceanographic variables with timely information as to like who to contact during these um, disaster events, I'm not sure about that, but I could get back to you. Great, thanks. Excellent. Well, thank you, Leah. And we will move on to our next speaker, Joe Bishop. Um, and I will just mention that we are now in session three. So Leah kicked us off with our session three. Um, that's all about broader Caribbean engagement. All right. Uh, let's switch over the presentation here. All right. 
So our next speaker, Joe Bishop, um, he received an honorable discharge from the United States Navy. Um, he went on to earn a degree in ocean engineering from Florida Atlantic University. Um, and his specialty is underwater acoustics, which made him a perfect fit for the ocean acoustics division at the Atlantic Oceanographic and Meteorological Laboratory. Um, he has been with NOAA and ML for 20 years. Welcome, Joe. Welcome, Joe. Good morning. Thank you, Katie. Do we go to next? Okay, just a little background. In 2007, a group of universities and labs got together to choose sites for a Caribbean-wide climate change program with the goal of expanding the coral reef early warning system, the cruise network. And if you look to the left of the pile on there, that was the early version that was created by Jim Handy to monitor these things. And the, the picture in the middle was a buoy that they decided to go to from a certain manufacturer. And the image to the right shows you where they were located um, in the Caribbean. Now keep in mind that all of those stations are now in operation. They were either destroyed by hurricanes or the manufacturer of that particular buoy did not live up to their obligation to uh, sustain the use of those buoys. So in 2018, funded by NOAA's uh, Coral Reef Conservation Program, and the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center in Belize, we decided to put in five new stations. And that, those were in Antigua, St. Kitts, St. Vincent, St. Lucia, and Grenada. Next. This image shows you on the Eastern Caribbean where those buoys were located. Next. Okay, we decided to go with a different design. We went with a Nexus uh, CB950, which was lighter and easier to transport, but it was also robust. And it's also has the ability where we can add other sensors. Before we even start putting the buoys in, we got to have discussions with the host countries to decide where the locations are. Once that's done, drilling goes in and they put pins in the bottom. Then we as a team, my team goes down and we unpack the buoy and assemble it with the locals so they know how the buoy functions. Uh, the pictures on the bottom just show a splash in the buoy and then we tow it out to the site. Next. Okay, so what data are we really collecting? We're collecting the usual meteorological parameters such as wind speed, direction, gusts, air temperature, relative humidity, barometer, but we're also collecting oceanographic parameters such as sea temperature, salinity, ODO, and we have the ability to add more sensors to these buoys. Next, please. This is just an example of some of the data that's coming in from these particular buoys. On these, these buoys, we put two PAR sensors on there, one a terrestrial and one an underwater sensor. And no, not yet. And we have the wind data being picked up by, by Sala. Uh, we also have seabird sensor on it picking up in uh, oceanographic. And we also have an AMR sensor on it. It also gives us wind speed direction, but it also gives us uh, GPS information, latitude, longitude, in case the buoy breaks free and we got to try to chase it down. Okay, next. Okay, now for the ugly portion of this. Uh, keep in mind, we're dealing with multiple countries and multiple ministries. And within those ministries are multiple departments. Now the prime minister and the uh, minister heads may be happy to receive these buoys, but then when they assign it to a particular department, they may not be overjoyed in receiving this buoy and, and getting extra work. So it's our job to go in and make sure that these guys understand that they can handle it. Because a lot of times it's just out of fear, like, hey, I've never dealt with a buoy. How do I handle this? What do I do? Okay, next. Okay, now we come up with the bad situation here. And I've listed in that accountants, cell phone companies, slow purchasing departments, and of course, hurricanes and COVIDs. I'll give you an example of an accounting problem. Uh, we had seen kids up and running and it was running fine for months. All of a sudden the station went dark. We couldn't figure out why. We looked at the data, there was no reason, there was no storms. But then we found out that an accountant was overlooking the cell phone bills 
And she noticed that there was a data plan on one of the cell phone bills and they don't provide data plans for their cell phones. So she turned off the service. So that's why we lost all of our data. The other problem we've had with cell phone companies, which Digicel decided to change the APNs on all of their uh, products. So we couldn't get data from two of our buoys. And then several months later, the cell phone companies went to 4G, which our modems in the buoys were incompatible with 4G. So that shut down the whole network for a while. Uh, slow purchasing departments, we've got a couple of islands that are trying to get new SIM cards to get away from Digicel and to go with Flow, but their, their purchasing departments are really slow. And of course, hurricanes are creating problems because the buoys have all been brought back in so they can change out the modems, but now a lot of them are reluctant to put the buoys back out because of the hurricane season. And of course, the islands were not exempt from COVID, so they've been pretty well shut, uh, shut down also and have had a hard time trying to get things accomplished. Okay, next. Oops. Okay, so now the good out of all this. None of these problems are major, so they can all be resolved. St. Kitts has been up and it's been reporting data for several months now. Antigua's got its modem change. They're waiting to redeploy the buoy, which is part of the thing maybe has in it with the hurricane season. St. Vincent has a modem change, but they're waiting on solar panels, which are stuck in customs. So that should have been in the bed also. Uh, St. Lucia is awaiting to get their SIM card and Grenada's got the SIM card, changed the modem and they're servicing the buoy. If you wanna look at some of the data that we're receiving from St. Kitts, the website on the bottom uh, is a public website that you can go to. Next, please. If you look at it on your cell phone, you'll see an image like this at first and on the left, and then you click on the green dot and that will bring you to the actual data. If you look at it on your computer screen, you'll see the image on the right and that's what you'll get. Next, please. Okay, in conclusion and some lessons learned, we need to make sure that we have responsible parties, an interested person or team on site to do routine maintenance at least once a month. You can't have a, sex, a successful buoy deployment without rigorous maintenance and long range maintenance plans. Most of the times all it requires is just go out and clean off the instruments. But then there's gotta be a maintenance plan for the instruments that need recalibration once a year or biannually. And what I would emphasize to all of you, don't buy and install more than what you really need to answer your conservation and research needs. Don't put a bunch of things on a buoy that you're not gonna really use. Okay, next. And I'd like to thank our friends at Five Cs for working with us on this. And next, please. Any questions and answers? Thank you, folks. Great, thank you so okay. much, Joe. Lee, do we have any questions for Joe? One question is to the lifetime of these systems. Is there like a projected lifetime for these and a plan um, in terms of how far into the future you'll continue to have this network? I would say the buoys would probably last at least you know three to four years, you know, easily with maintenance. Uh, our only regret is our first phase. They went to the buoys and the manufacturer that particular buoy didn't live up to their obligation to keep them running. So that's why they're all down. There's been talks undergoing to change them over to the newer buoy, which is a lot simpler to use. It's, it's you know, it's, it's, you can add different things to it. So it, it can be sustained for a while if we can get the funding. But keep in mind, we've uh, five C's got the money for these buoys, and they've been given to the particular countries. So the country owns the buoy, so it's up to them to turn around and and make sure that they're maintained. And if anything needs to be changed, they need to to step up to the plate and change them. Great. We don't have any more questions. Okay. Sounds great. Hey, well, thank you. thank you so much, Joe. Really appreciate it. All right. I spoke too soon, but it looks like we're we're good. It was just a, a kind of a confirmation of that issue regarding the voice. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Our next speaker um, is Ashley Hill. 
And I'm just gonna throw up her presentation really quick here. Great. Um, Ashley Hill is the Florida and Caribbean Regional Coordinator for NOAA's Marine Debris Program. Um, she's based in St. Petersburg, Florida, and works with a variety of partners on marine, on marine debris related projects and activities throughout Florida, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Welcome, Ashley. Thank you, Katie, and thank you all for joining us today. As Katie mentioned, my name is Ashley Hill, and I'm the Florida and Caribbean Regional Coordinator for NOAA's Marine Debris Program. And I'm very excited to share with you today some of our current Caribbean-based initiatives. Uh, next slide, please. So I want to start off by specifying exactly what we're referring to when we use the term rain debris. Rain debris is essentially anything that is solid and man-made that is in our marine waters and Great Lakes that should not be there. And this can be anything from small pieces of plastic to large abandoned vessels, and it can come from land such as consumer debris or from water-based activities such as fishing gear from recreational and commercial fisheries. Next slide, please. And, oh, back one more, sorry. Thank you. Uh, when left in our environment, marine debris can cause a variety of harmful impacts. For example, many forms of debris can entangle, trap, or be ingested by wildlife, while heavy debris items can cause damage to sensitive habitats such as coral reefs. Marine debris also negatively impacts our economy. Dirty beaches obviously affect tourism and recreation, and gear loss and the resulting bycatch can affect the fishing industry. Um, also, marine debris can pose a hazard to navigation and human safety. Next slide, please. To tackle these harmful impacts, NOAA's Marine Debris Program was established by Congress in 2006 as the federal lead for marine debris. And our vision is for the global ocean and its coasts be free from the impacts of marine debris. Next slide. We are working towards this vision through our different program pillars. Prevention focuses on education and outreach to turn off the tap of debris entering into the environment. Removal is, of course, removing debris that does make it into the water. Research so that we can better understand the sources and impacts of marine debris. Emergency response, since natural disasters such as hurricanes can generate a large amount of debris in a short amount of time, and regional coordination. So as Katie mentioned, my region includes Florida, Puerto Rico, and USBI, but we have nine other regional coordinators that are strategically placed throughout the country. And our role is basically to facilitate those other pillars and make sure that we're all working together on marine debris issues within our region. To further our vision, we also offer competitive grants that align with several of these pillars. We offer removal grants on an annual basis and grants for prevention and research in alternating years. We are currently accepting letters of intent for research projects and more information on all of our different funding opportunities is available on our website. Next slide. So we do have several currently funded projects in the Caribbean and the first one I wanna highlight is a recently announced removal grant that was awarded to the Ocean Foundation, partnering with Conservación Conciencia. They will be working with local dive fishers to remove derelict fishing gear, focusing mainly on the waters around Eastern Puerto Rico. The local knowledge that these individuals have about the waters and fishing grounds is a great benefit to the project, but their involvement is also helping to increase stewardship of their resources. In addition to removing debris, they will be also hosting learning exchanges between Puerto Rico and USBI fishers so that they can share knowledge, experiences, and best practices to collaboratively address derelict fishing here in the region. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the University of the Virgin Islands is another current removal grantee. This project is removing debris from hurricanes Irma and Maria from shorelines on St. Thomas, St. John, and St. Croix through a series of great mangrove cleanups. These great mangrove cleanups are community-based events that remove a large amount of debris, but also serve as an education and outreach tool to the local community. Through these cleanups, UVI is expecting to remove 12,000 pounds of debris and restore five different miles of shoreline. They are also leading the efforts to develop a marine debris action plan for the USBI so that they can improve collaboration among partners working to address marine debris. 
we do have a workshop, so virtually bring together stakeholders that's planned for next week. I have included contact information on this slide for the PI on the project, Kristen Grimes. If you are currently involved in or plan to be involved in marine debris work within the territory, I definitely encourage you to reach out to her for more information about joining the workshop. Next slide, please. Another exciting project is a Girls in Science initiative that's spearheaded by Yuritsa Rivera, our hurricane response coordinator based in San Juan. She is working with a handful of students from Puerto Rico's Specialized School in Sciences, Mathematics, and Technology, also known as CIMATEC. And these young female students are learning about marine debris issues and solutions through direct interaction with the women in science shown here. The goal is to empower the students and encourage the involvement of women in science at a young age. The students will create short videos on different marine debris topics in Spanish, with some also available in English. And these videos will then be shared with other students at CIMATEC and can also be used across Puerto Rico and other Spanish-speaking classrooms. Next slide. So I want to switch over to how our program responds to debris from natural disasters. Again, our program was established in 2006. And in those early years, we would sometimes be involved in larger storm events, but it was really only on a case-by-case -case or as-needed basis. But starting in 2014, after amendments were made to the Marine Debris Act, we began to lead coordination efforts to develop response guides for states and territories to help with pre-event coordination. Next slide. So these guides are meant to be a resource for local, state, and federal governments and other responders by providing all relevant information in a single location. During the development of these guides, we engage with stakeholders to clarify roles and identify gaps so that we're all better prepared when an incident does occur. The response guide for the USVI was completed earlier this year, and we're currently engaging with stakeholders to develop the Puerto Rico guide. Next slide. So after a major incident occurs, we may also receive supplemental funding from Congress to assist in the removal of marine debris through non-competitive grants. Puerto Rico and USVI both received funding after Hurricanes Irma and Maria. In USVI, 4.2 million was awarded to the Department of Planning and Natural Resources. And in Puerto Rico, 3.7 was awarded to the Department of Natural and Environmental Resources. Next slide. These projects are targeting a variety of different types of debris, such as sunken and displaced vessels, remains of houseboats, large debris aggregations, and damaged docks and piers, along with debris that entered the marine environment from land because of the hurricane strong winds and storm surge. And this includes anything from appliances, parts of cars, to pieces of roofs and different walls of residences. Uh, next slide, please. So I hope this brief overview gives you just a little taste of the variety of the different initiatives NOAA's Marine Debris Program is working on in the Caribbean. I encourage you to visit our website, marinedebris.noaa.gov, for additional information about our work in the Caribbean and also across the United States. So with that, I'll thank you for your time and look forward to questions. Thank you so much, Ashley. Lee, are there any questions? Thanks, Ashley. There are not any questions right now. I did put in the chat for everybody, so hopefully everyone can see it. The information uh, regarding funding from the Marine Debris Program, as Ashley said, there is a call for proposals open right now. There's also, I also put in Kristen's contact information in case people didn't have time to write it down looking at the presentation, uh, but there are no questions coming in right now. Perfect. Thank you. Well, awesome. Thank you so much, Ashley. Um, we appreciate um, the presentation and the overview of the Marine Debris Program. All right. Our last speaker um, slash presentation um, for this uh, session three um, is our fabulous chair, Lee. Um, she's going to um, be providing an overview of a video, and then we're going to show a video on ocean acidification. Yeah, so in the interest of the time, we might not want to do the full video, but um, this is just to let people know we received an education and outreach mini grant from the Ocean Acidification Program, 
And we produced a video about the ocean acidification buoy that is in La Parguera, Puerto Rico. So some of you may be familiar with it. And this is actually the first time that the ocean acidification program funded something in Spanish, but don't worry, English speakers, it has English subtitles. So um, we'll just play a little bit of it, but it will be posted to our website. It'll be posted to the ocean acidification website and is, is already posted to the YouTube channel of the person who created it. So if you have um, interest in having a copy of the video, uh, please let me know. Go ahead. I think Sammy, you're the one who's going to play it. Yeah. Yep, she sorry. I'm having a little bit of trouble sharing my screen. Let's see. All right, there you go, Sammy. You should be able. Great. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Sounds out. Can you still hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay, great. Here we go. Desde 2008, la boya del programa de acidificación oceánica de la NOAA está instalada en la parguera Puerto Rico, lugar donde por más de 50 años se han realizado estudios oceanográficos que permiten conocer la química, la biología, la geología y la física del mar Caribe. La cantidad de CO2 atmosférico ha aumentado un 35% desde la revolución industrial. Este gas de efecto de invernadero afecta la vida de animales y plantas y regula la temperatura del planeta. Los cambios en el uso de la tierra, tales como la deforestación y las emisiones de los combustibles fósiles a partir de la quema del petróleo, el carbón y el gas natural, han contribuido a un aumento dramático en la cantidad de CO2, lo que afecta a la química del océano y, consecuentemente, la vida marina. Se sí, usaba acerca de la, de la civilización oceánica, pero no sé exactamente en, en qué se compone en qué está trabajando eso. El programa de monitoreo de arrecifes de coral de la NOAA estableció que la parguera es una estación fija en donde siempre se van a tomar datos y donde esa huella va a estar ahí estacionaria. Esta estación 3 lo que significa es que vamos a tener un set de parámetros que vamos a monitorear. Uno de ellos serían los pues, socioeconómicos, cómo las personas ven los efectos de la acidificación y cómo les va a afectar. Lo que viene a ver los turistas aquí en la palera es la diversidad en corales vivos de diferentes especies y muchas veces a profundidades mínimas. Otro set de parámetros serían biológicos cómo los organismos biológicos van a ser afectados por la acidificación. Y el otro set de parámetros que se toman son la química, porque los efectos de acidificación y el proceso de acidificación es un proceso químico que ocurre en el agua. Cuando el dióxido de carbono atmosférico se disuelve en el agua de mar, reacciona con el agua y los ciclones de carbono. Esto produce ácido carbónico y a su vez el agua de mar. Una mayor entrada de dióxido de carbono al agua produce más acidez. Medimos la acidez en una escala de pH, la cual comprende valores de 0 a 14. Los valores menores a 7 son más ácidos y los valores mayores a 7 son más básicos o alcalinos. Muchos de nuestros organismos marinos utilizan el carbonato de calcio para construir sus esqueletos y conchas. Esto los hace altamente susceptibles a los cambios en la acidificación oceánica. Crustáceos como la langosta espinosa, bivalvos como las ostras y los mejillones, animales de concha como el carrucho y constructores de arrecife como los corales se pueden ver afectados por la acidificación oceánica. El aumento en la acidez reduce o detiene el proceso de calcificación. El objetivo de la boya es 
cuantificar los efectos de la acidificación en áreas de arrecifes de coral a largo y a corto plazo. Con esta boya tenemos 9 a 10 años de datos, así que podemos establecer tendencias hacia qué dirección va, eh, va aumentando o va disminuyendo la acidificación. Para esto se necesitan observaciones a largo plazo. Y basado en estudios científicos y la importancia de esto es que uno recopila, uno puede vigilar cuán prudente puede trabajar zonas de agua. La huella de acidificación que está en la palquera es un esfuerzo que se ha hecho a nivel global de parte de la NOAA, en donde ellos se han dado a la tarea de monitorear el estado de acidificación en diferentes áreas. Aquí en la palquera tenemos el área de arrecifes de coral, así que esta boya es una de las dos boyas que hay en el Caribe que monitorea acidificación de los océanos en áreas donde hay arrecifes de coral. Esta boya mide CO2 en el agua, CO2 en el aire, temperatura, salinidad, y tiene otros set de instrumentos que miden eh, clorofila, oxígeno, y también tiene un set de instrumentos que mide eh, pH en el océano. Gracias a, a estas observaciones también podemos establecer otro tipo de colaboraciones para entonces expandir nuestros proyectos. Uno de ellos es el programa de acidificación de la NOAA, colaboración con el programa de sistemas de observación en el Caribe, CARICUS, y el Departamento de Ciencias Marinas aquí en Puerto Rico con SIGRAM Puerto Rico y la Universidad de New Hampshire, que es donde yo estoy haciendo mi doctorado. En ese proyecto eh, tratamos de entender un poco mejor cuál es, cuál es la variabilidad y cómo estas observaciones que se toman con la boya son diferentes en otras áreas. Y lo que queremos hacer es un mapa en las áreas costeras, especialmente áreas de arrecife, que sean vulnerables a la acidificación, de entender un poco más sobre la acidificación en la bahía bioluminiscente, entender procesos como la llegada de salgazo y cuáles son los efectos del salgazo en la acidificación y en los niveles de química de ese, del océano. También se han colocado cinco unidades de acreción de calcificación en cada estación de monitoreo. Dichas unidades son placas para medir la tasa de calcificación a largo plazo. Este estudio proporciona información sobre las tasas de acreción y sirve como base para detectar cambios en la química del agua de mar debido a la acidificación del océano. Los datos que tomamos aquí en la palguera podemos compararlos con otras áreas de arrecifes de coral en el Caribe. ¿Por qué? Porque son, tenemos los mismos ecosistemas, eh, mismos organismos, son áreas que son eh, cercanas a la costa, que están también colonizadas por los mismos tipos de ecosistemas, mangles, hierbas marinas. Así que podemos utilizar estos datos para caracterizar otras áreas en el área del Caribe. Puedo hablar con eh, uno de los, de los que trabajan en, en, la, en la boya y, y material de la entiendo en realidad el uso específico que tiene este instrumento, esa huella de monitoreo. Y ahora yo en lo que y le puedo explicar a las personas en realidad de qué trata esa huella, cuán importante es tener esa huella ahí, porque así, después de esa data, se pueden tomar medidas de conservación. Los organismos afectados por la acidificación oceánica también reciben el impacto de la basura marina la degradación de la calidad del agua y las perturbaciones físicas. En la medida que reducimos estos impactos, ayudamos a proteger a los organismos marinos que están experimentando el estrés causado por la acidificación oceánica. Tú puedes ayudar a los organismos marinos involucrándote en proyectos de organizaciones ambientales en tu comunidad. Excellent. Okay, so that, we just thought that was kind of a fun way to wrap all this up. Um, I did post the YouTube link for those who are interested in that. And as I said, it will also be on our uh, website. Um, and I can post that once we have it up. Um, but I just, at this point, want to say thank you to everyone, especially all of our spectacular speakers. And um, 
here on this page. Katie is very proud of the work she has done to have the, the QR code. So <laughs> Katie, <laughs> anything about that real quickly? Yes, well, thank you all so much for joining us today. We really hope that um, you know these presentations really spoke to you and that you know we really had a good update about some of the projects and activities that are taking place in the region. Um, but we hope that um, you get in touch with us. Um, we, we have a lot of really great resources. Um, you can sign up for our NOAA and the Caribbean newsletter here. Um, like Lee said earlier, these go out quarterly and we're always looking to highlight um, you know various projects and activities um, within the region as well as you know uh, funding opportunities and other initiatives. Announcement. So um, please sign up for the newsletters and then um, if you want to contact us about anything related to this um, webinar or just any other information that you want to share with us, um, please email us at caribbeannews at noaa.gov. And then finally, um, please visit our website. Um, we always post our latest newsletters on our website. Um, and then you also will have um, contact information um, for us as well. Um, like Lee said, um, our website is going um, through a little bit of a change, um, so please bear with us. Um, but it also will have the link to today's webinar, um, and we will be posting all of the contact information as well as their presentation. Uh, so thank you all so much again for joining us. Um, we look forward to working with you all in the future. Thank Thanks, you. Everybody. Have a great day. Have a great day, you too. Thank you. Yes, thank you all to our presenters. Happy to share. Thanks for the opportunity. Yes, thank, thank you. you. We do have some additional questions for some of you, so we'll follow up and make sure all of that gets posted to the event website too. So thanks. Yes. Yep. And again, if you um uh, put in a question or put um, a comment in the chat. Um, we're happy to follow up with you. Um, but then all of our co uh, presenters' contact information will be posted on our webinar webpage. Um, so you can also follow up with them individually. Hi, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Leah.